Well, greetings, everybody. Welcome to the show. On today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast, a brand new Godzilla X Kong trailer that is completely stupid and kind of awesome at the same time. Uh, <laughs> Masters of the Universe actually has a He Man movie with Travis Knight, the director of Kubo and the Two Strings, possibly directing it. Also, good news if you're looking forward to the Thunderbolts like I am in the new Marvel Universe. They're moving it up a couple of months. We're going to talk about that. The first reactions for Dune 2 have come out of its first public screening in Paris, and they are phenomenal. And it's finally official. I said by Super Bowl. I missed it by a couple of days. But Fantastic Forecast officially announced. We're going to talk about that and a few things more. The John Campbell Show podcast starts right now. Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, the John Campus Show podcast. Coming to you from right here in our quaint little studio, brought to you in part by our friends at Mint Mobile. I'm, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world movies and movie news, TV and streaming, and all sorts of good stuff. Not just giving you our opinions, but also giving you some background and context so you guys can form your own well informed opinions, whether they're the same or a little bit different than ours. And we're so glad you're joining us today on this game day. Game day. Yeah. Web, ladies and gentlemen, opens in theaters today. Rush out, buy your tickets now before they sell out. And you can't get in to experience this event of a generation. Ray Orr and I, 2.30 this afternoon. Valentine's, Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day. Just picked up right now. Mm -mm. Not because of that movie, but because of this trailer. <laughs> I'm so excited <laughs> to see Madam Webb today. I'm joined, of course, by Ray Ora. Yep. Jonathan Boyko's here. One love today. R writer, director, producer Robert Meyer Burnett is here. To see Kaiju have a bond on a Valentine's Day <laughs> like we've seen just now. It's a bromance, Warms Rob. my heart. It's a bromance. <laughs> and most importantly... You guys are here. Thanks for being here and making this little show part of your day. And here's how it's going to go. We're going to start off by talking about those topics that I listed off. Then in the last part of the show, we're going to take your live comments and questions. If you guys have a topic or a question for our show, and it's appropriate to be used on our show, go ahead and use the Super Chat feature in the live chat, and we will address those in the second part of the show. All right, guys. With all that down, let's start things off with this. Uh, it's kind of Godzilla's world right now. <laughs> I mean, we had Monarch on Apple TV Plus, which was great. I, I was very, very happy with the Monarch series. And then, of course, we had Godzilla Minus One, uh, which was thoroughly enjoyable. Uh, maybe the some people think maybe the best Godzilla movie ever. I, I don't know if I agree it's the best ever, but it was certainly one of the best. It was great. And now we got Godzilla X-Con coming around, where... King, not King Kong, but Godzilla is doing his best Ezra Miller flash impersonation. <laughs> Running down the thing like he's all <laughs> hopped up on some, you know, on some roids there. Getting ready for the Olympics. The, the big Titan roids. Olympics uh, going on. And so they, they dropped the new trailer for it. <laughs> and like I said in the opening, I, I am torn. I'm a, a little bit mixed because it is an absolutely ridiculous and stupid trailer. I, 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 I'm sorry. It is ridiculous and it's stupid. And yet, I couldn't look away. Because in its ridiculousness and in its stupidity, it was oddly awesome at the same time. <laughs> Completely no sense whatsoever, but it was kind of awesome. And I was rolling my eyes like King Kong Bundy rolling out of the ring when I saw them, we've made some augmentations or whatever she says. And they put on his RoboCop glove, his Iron Man glove onto King Kong. And I'm Infinity like, I'm, Gauntlet, dude. and I'm in the middle of my thought process. I'm thinking, this is so stupid. And then he punches the dude and the giant tooth lands in the road. I'm like, just when this trailer couldn't be any more stupid, it totally redeems itself. With this tooth landing on the road, I'm like, listen, this movie looks all kinds of dumb. But I would be lying to you, Rob, if I didn't admit that I'm 
kind of all kinds of looking forward to watching it. As I don't you know. You, you saw the trailer. What did you think? Uh, you know, I have to say that uh, Godzilla vs. Kong, the first one, I, I loved the uh, Cursed Earth. I love the fights. But the rest of the movie, like there's a tram system from Florida to Asia. I didn't buy into that. So it was half fun for me. If you're going to go dumb, I want fun to follow that word right away. And this movie defines that. To me, look, Pacific Rim is the bar to, to, bar, the bar to meet. To. And then right underneath, uh, uh, I loved Mike Doherty's Godzilla movie. Not going to lie. Mm. Loved it. To me, this looks like it strikes the perfect balance of exactly what I want from a modern Godzilla movie. Because Godzilla 2014, a little too serious. A little too serious. I look at this, dude, and I think to myself, oh, yeah. <laughs> this is exactly, I mean, look at this. This has mecha. This has giant monster fights. This has the Dimensional Infinity warps. Gauntlet. This, this <laughs> to me, gauntlet. is exactly <laughs> like you can't, if you were to reach in and scoop out the part of my brain that's been watching these movies since I was a little kid and plop it into an ice cream bowl and put uh, whipped cream and a cherry on top and ate it, it would taste as good as this movie looks. <laughs> I think I want to eat your brain just with saying, on it. I'm just saying. And you know, it, and it looks like somebody in the live chat was mentioning it, but I was just thinking to myself, uh, this movie is going to be a tag team match, a world tag team title match yep. like between uh, King Ginger Gorilla there, and at, this dude, and, and some other thing, whatever that Shinzu thing is coming out of yep. the the lava versus Godzilla. Listen, 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 just just shut up, shut up and listen. If there isn't a moment in this movie. <laughs> where it looks like Godzilla and King Kong aren't tagging each other in, it's a completely wasted opportunity. Well, I, wa I want to see that big Thanos glove like tagging Godzilla and Godzilla coming to do something. But it really looks like they're capturing the spirit of, if you go back to the Showa era of, of kaiju movies, that they're capturing a little bit of the original King Kong versus Godzilla movie, or God Godzilla versus King Kong that they did back in the 60s. And, John, this makes me, like, I don't have kids myself, but I kind of want to get a gaggle of kids. That you know of. Fill, that I know. Well, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and give them as much cotton candy and sugar as humanly possible. And then get them all Man, giant really sugar wrong. drinks and take them into the theater. That's usually my strategy when I bring Ray to a movie. Well, yeah. and that's, I just want to watch this film surrounded by a bunch of screaming kids hopped up. Because this looks like the kind of movie that if I was six years old and saw it, it would be... Like, like I don't know, seeing somebody walk across water. It looks like it's that good. <laughs> I hope. I mean, I, go ahead. I can't wait. Go ahead, Sean. No, it's just you guys are talking. I, I'm seeing this movie for the humans. Am I? Am I the only one? We got uh, uh, not Ray Stevens. What's a um? Uh, ba Brian Tyree. Ty Ty no, no, uh, the, the, the dude, the dude from um, Downton Abbey and Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. Oh, What's, I don't know. Something. With something Stevens. Stevens. Oh, uh, da, 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 oh, Dan, Dan Stevens. Stevens. Thank you. Oh, Dan Stevens. The host. There. Or the, I, the guest. Like, the guest. Pardon me, not the host. It looks like this movie, we're going to get a lot of King Kong, like our Kong in the beginning. Oh, yeah. I just hope they don't wait too long to bring Godzilla out. I, I, I love Godzilla. I hope it's 90% Kong, 10% yeah. Godzilla. What are you like, talking about? No, no, no. Oh. It feels like Godzilla. No, no, no. Godzilla is the Godzilla is is what it's, for me, it's the draw. Kong is a romantic. Yeah, Kong is Kong is in a softy deep down inside. It's Godzilla who's going to save the world. <laughs> He's the one who what does. they Come need on. to do is every time they're about to make an impact, cut away to humans talking. By the way, can I just yeah. say that? Yeah, you see the the two tag teams <laughs> about to fight, and then cut to just audible you know, groans in the theater. Yeah, cut to Rebecca Hall <laughs> no, making a sandwich or something. The no, they've caught. They've, they've finally got the balance right, as Depeche Mode would sing. Now let's <laughs> nice Depeche Mode call it. Okay, <laughs> but let's be honest. I, if I had to put five bucks on it, my five great bucks? box saying it's Kong Jesus. It's Godzilla Jesus. If I had to put five <laughs> bucks on it, my guess is this movie's probably going to be pretty bad. Yeah. All I'm saying. And what I'm are not you saying? saying? I'm just You're saying, saying it's that. It's going to be pretty bad. As dumb as the trailer looks, there's something giddily awesome about it, and I hope it's going to pay off. I it's, I just it's, I I know it's probably going to be bad, but. It's, I'm in, I'm I'm excited to see the it. stupid train okay, left a long okay, time but, ago. But, you're still at the station. The we all left. If you if you haven't bought into this stuff by now, 
then maybe it's not for you. <laughs> this, this movie is going to be dumb. <laughs> maybe it's not for you. Maybe okay. this movie is going to be dumb, but it's going to be great. Um, <laughs> but you see, you got to understand something. If you look at the, the overall, the gestalt of the Godzilla franchise, uh -huh. sometimes you'll get a kaiju movie like Rodan, which yeah. is very, very serious for the most part. But then you get Godzilla versus Megalon, and you get Gigan and you get Jet Jaguar, you know, it's kind of like that. So the Godzilla movies have have run the gamut of what different move what they can be. You get to the Shin Godzilla, it's very serious. Godzilla minus one, very, very serious, serious, very hearts felt. It's time we go the other yes. direction, and we need to deliver what the American Godzilla <laughs> movies have yes. never quite reached. I give you Godzilla X Kong. Thank well, God somebody knows what they're doing. Oh, yeah. I was about, what, I was what is, about I, I can't remember Maybe when it comes out. out. I mean, oh, yeah. this is the second trailer. March, right? It's got to be getting close. It's probably March. Do Can I just that? say for all you primate fans, you're getting a Godzilla movie and a Kong movie in March and an Apes movie in May. March My 29th. God. By the way, is, March this the 29th. is this trailer the first time that they've said... It feels to me in the, the, uh, the movies that they have set up that Kong is a titan but in this trailer they seem to make a distinction between the titans and the giant apes the protectors right like the titans are the protectors of nature the giant apes are the protectors of human so i up until now it, mm. it seems that they've always said that kong is a titan but now they seem to be making a distinction so are you do you think they're saying that maybe i, I Kong's think they might very, i think that's a very astute observation yeah, i think yeah, you're right yeah, but yeah. i also want to point out when i was a child Pre Star Wars. Oh. And Star Trek was only a TV series that there were three beloved franchises I had when I was a kid James Bond, Planet of the Apes, and Godzilla. Mm. And two out of three of those are coming out within two months of each other <laughs> and both look like they're delivering. So somebody has figured out when Star Wars gives us Rise of Skywalker, we get Godzilla X Kong. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Let's go. I hope it's great. I can't I wait. hope it's great. This is even right. Friday. Guys, with that down. I haven't even had anything to drink except Diet <laughs> I Pepsi. I think we need to go break right now. I think Rob needs to get some air. <laughs> Let's move on to this, shall we? You know, uh, Bumblebee, the movie that came out a number of years ago, was a really, really important film because you were talking about a Transformers franchise that had literally been run into the ground. I mean, it was it was beyond dying. It was dead. And then came along this Bumblebee movie that Travis Knight, the director of Kubo and the Two Strings, which is awesome, came along and did what was seemingly impossible. He resuscitated a corpse. He took this Transformers corpse and he resuscitated it and he breathed life into it. He breathed a humanity into it. He made something special and made it a character driven film, even about robots, right? I'll still never forget being at watching Bumblebee for the first time and then starting on Cybertron and seeing all the battle going on and like seeing Soundwave. And I was like, ah, I was losing my mind, right? But ever since then, 2018, Bumblebee, since then, Travis Knight, who did Kubo and the Two Strings, that got Oscar attention. Bumblebee, which kind of brought this decrepit body kind of thing back to life. It breathed, got a heartbeat going again into it, right? Hasn't directed anything since. In almost six years. Hasn't directed almost anything since. And then, kind of in the same vein, everybody's been waiting for this He-Man movie. Wanda <laughs> Masters of the Universe. Yeah. Our friend Christian Harloff says... That a He-Man movie, a Masters of the Universe live-action movie could be the perfect cross between Star Wars and Lord of the Rings. It's like, it, it really could. That's that's what it can be. And yet, nothing. We had, uh, uh, not James Wan, but uh, the director of Crazy Rich Asians. Um, John Cho. John, John Cho. There was some talk for a while that he was going to direct one. Then there was something else. Then a bunch of concept art came about seven years ago remember that one with battle cat the, yeah, that concept that art came out like oh it's moving ahead and then nothing then out of nowhere yesterday the hollywood reporter writes this travis knight 
may just have the power. <laughs> the Leica CEO and part-time filmmaker is in early talks to direct the Long in the Works live-action adaptation of Masters of the Universe for Amazon MGM Studios, The Hollywood Reporter has confirmed. Knight isn't coming alone. Chris Butler, a longtime Knight con collaborator who wrote and co-directed Paranorman and who wrote Kubo and the Two Strings, among other projects, has been brought on to rewrite the script. This is awesome from top to bottom in this. Bringing along, first of all, having a writer and director duo is great because they, they already know each other's shorthand. They know what their sensibilities are. And from a writing point of view, the guy who wrote Kubo, Paranorman is a delightful yeah. movie, too. Yeah, it is. It's completely delightful. And for anybody who hasn't seen Kubo and the Two Strings, you're thinking, another animated movie, all like, he just does kids' movies. Uh, you got to watch Kubo and the Two Strings. It's, it's heartfelt and moving and has mythology and true emotion, and it's, it's a great, great movie. Now you team him up with the director of that. Uh, and the guy who who did the near impossible with that Bumblebee movie. I'll tell you what, Rob. I mean, there's a lot of directors' names you could have thrown out there that would have got me kind of excited for this. But Travis Knight is definitely one of them for two reasons. One, he would be a great director to come and do He-Man. But also, I'm excited that he's directing again. Like, why hasn't this guy directed? Maybe he's just been busy being a CEO. But having only directed those two films and then nothing else, I love this news. I I don't know what on earth you can do with a He-Man in live action, because mm -hmm. all I can think about is Dolph Lundgren. But and uh, who was it again that played Skeletor in that? Oh, Frank Langella. Frank Langella. That little thing when he comes out of the goo at the end, like oh my god. Anyway, Courtney Cox too, by the way. Mm, my original, my very first celebrity crush was Courtney Cox. She was a human, right? Yes, she's she the first celebrity I ever saw in Los Angeles when I moved here back in uh, 1988. Really? Yep. Was that before or after the uh, Bruce Springsteen Dancing in the Dark video? I guess it would have been after. It that. was after. I I, <clears throat> I was I was at a uh, ATM across from the Hard Rock at Beverly Center, and I was just uh, w standing behind a woman getting her money. She turns around, and I was standing there going, "It was one of those things where you're Courtney Cox," <laughs> and she was like, "Why, well, yes, I am." I'm like, "Love your work." But, Aren't before you win? before you get to Rob, like I just want to point out the Bumblebee thing again. That's a secondary character he made a good movie out of. Yeah. Like he didn't use Optimus, he didn't use Megatron. It just shows you how much good writing and a good script can do yeah. for anything. Yeah. So so I'm all for this. Like it's 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 good news that he's gonna be a The one so thing I'll say is this though. And it's imperative. Speaking of the Dolph Lundgren movie, don't bring them to Earth. Don't bring them to Earth. Yeah, don't. I, I, I don't want to see He-Man and Man-at-Arms and many faces and, and, and whatever and Evil Merman. Man. And what, and then, I don't want to see them on Earth. Have it on Eternia. Just, that's where He-Man is supposed to be. That's where the story takes place. Have it there. Anyway, Rob, okay. you hear this news? What do you think? Well, you know, I have to tell you, before Bumblebee came out, I got hired by, I guess, Paramount. And they were. I had to go interview Travis Knight. And I interviewed him for this licensing. They were going to make a licensing video that they were going to take to the license, the yearly licensing convention. And I talked to him. I sat down with him for about an hour and interviewed him. And he was an Im incredibly impressive guy. Like as a kid, he was like a DJ and he did all this crazy stuff. Cause you know, he's the son of Phil Knight, the founder of Nike. <laughs> so he grew up as a wealthy kid, but he was a really thoughtful, very impressive guy. And, I thought, and, and the listening to him wax rhapsodic about the Transformers and what he hoped to achieve and what, what he was doing with Bumblebee made me really respect him, which is, as you pointed out, it has been surprising to me that he hasn't directed another live-action feature since then. So I am. I think this choice is perfect for the reasons that you stated. You know, I want to say, I want to say it was by a screenwriter named Mark Persevich. I read a screenplay called Grey Skull. 20 years ago and uh it was i thought a great serious not totally not it wasn't godzilla x kong but it was a really serious take on he-man and the masters of the universe that i thought was great i'm sure i'm like this this movie has to get made never got made but it proved to me that a he-man movie could really be something uh worthy of like you said a cross between lord of the rings and star wars it just really depends on the approach 
And if anybody can pull this off, Travis Knight is the man because he and his screenwriter will take this seriously, but not totally seriously because it is, after all, He-Man. He'll do what he did to Bumblebee. I think he'll make a great a great movie. It's a great choice. And finally, for the first time, I'm excited about a He-Man movie. I, I got to say, I'm not, I'm not an ex-actor in ex-role sort of thing, but He-Man presents a particular challenge because there is a particular physical... He is called He-Man. And I got to say right now, I'm, although I'm sure Knight will come up with somebody great, for now, only one guy kind of comes to my mind. Jonathan? <laughs> I, I mean, th right now, because Alan Richson right now is hot. Not only is Reacher a big hit, he's in that new Henry Cavill movie with, with Henry Cavill, the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. Yes. So he's kind of rolling that. So he is, he checks both the main boxes. He's a solid, good actor, and he brings the physicality you're going to need for, for him. And he's not too young. He's yes. not a teenager. Yeah. Like the first Masters of the Universe uh, with Dolph Lundgren, they never touched on the Prince Adam aspect of He-Man, right? He was always No, they he didn't. They never touched that's, on that. That's important to me. And also, Battle Cat. You got to have Battle Cat. Oh, you 100% have yeah, Battle and Cat. Which are two elements that that Masters of the Universe disconnected with. That's why it disconnected with me when I watched him when I was younger. I was like, where's Battle Cat? Where's Prince Adam? There's none of that. those things because those things were important to me. When I was watching the cartoon series, you know, and, and here's the thing too, I, I can already hear that some people will say, "Alan Rich is he man, yeah, yeah, yeah," but I don't know if I can see him as a Prince Adam. Here, here's the other thing that they have to do, and I know this is going to piss some He Man and Masters of the Universe purists off. I understand that, but this is live action. As ridiculous as Superman and Clark Kent going, "I'm Clark Kent, I'm Superman, I'm Clark Kent, I'm Superman," you can't have Prince Adam look exactly like he-man right and and have a have a suspend disbelief that not everybody and not just look exactly like he-man have the physique if you see prince adam in his little <laughs> tight white long sleeve shirt he's fucking buff Did well you, yeah but he the, talks like this so yeah, you would never know no the, one new knows. Netflix part, the new netflix uh animation animated series they do it way better he's a sc skinny scrawny kid you're gonna have to shazam this you're gonna have to get a kid actor that, well, uh, not a not a kid, but a little like bit a, younger. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. a younger uh, actor, smaller, a little Scrawny, more baby face, a little bit. You Steve know. Rogers from Captain America: yeah, The First Avengers. I was just thinking the same exactly. thing before he took the serum. Yeah, yeah. So, or uh, or they could do it that Prince Adam transforms into He Man permanently. That yeah, once yeah, Prince Adam has ascended yeah. to. Yeah, you can. I I lean more towards Ray though. That part of the story of Master of the Universe is that duality of of Prince Adam. And He Man, and I and I do kind of. So you're right. They can just go. Uh, Skeletor cast a spell on me six years ago, and I'm always He Man right. now. They can do that. To go kind of go the Dolph Lundgren mm -hmm. route. But I would kind of like to see them play the duality. Yeah, a little no, bit. me too. But I think, look, I think Travis Knight and his writer, um, is, are, they're going to nail this. I yeah, and I think agree. for the very first yeah. time, this movie's at, not since 1987. They're finally going to get this made. Oh, yeah. I, I'm so excited. They absolutely made the right choices, and it's still never going to happen. <laughs> I know. You don't I know, think so? Man. Do you know how many times? I've been they've waiting said, for We've this. now got our director. We uh. now, we're now doing previs. We're you know, dude, ever since I was at AMC, worse than they've been doing this. Worse than Blade. No. They go, uh, yeah. It's worse than The Crow. It's, it's worse than The Crow, though The Crow's about to come out. But yeah. so, I, I mean. Isn't that weird? I, it's really weird. <laughs> I'm in a position where I am. I'm going to wait and see. Yeah. Like, I'll believe it when I see it. Give me a trailer. But I I hope this is it. I hope this is finally the time we've been waiting for. And they got the right director. This uh, is certainly time. the right director and right uh, and writer combo. So let's see how it goes. All right. With that down, guys, let's move on to this, shall we? Speaking of movies I've been waiting for. Marvel came out and announced that they were doing a Thunderbolts movie. And I confess that when they made that announcement, I uh, had no interest. And then they introduced the lineup. And once they introduced the lineup, I was like, okay, okay. I'm, I think I'm on board with this. Having, you know, Bucky in there. By the end of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, I got on board with Walmart Captain America. Yeah, why Russell? Why Russell? And I especially like him a lot more, even ever since Monarch. Mm -hmm. But 
and obviously Florence Pugh, Julia Louis Dreyfus, all that kind of stuff. But the big selling point to me was that they were putting David Harbour's Red Guardian in it. Because David Harbour's Red Guardian was the best and possibly the only really good thing about that Black Widow movie. <laughs> I fell in love with that character. I thought he was great, and I just kept thinking, I want to see more of him. But we've heard nothing but delays and this and that. There's even been some whispers recently that they might shelve the movie. Well, don't you worry about that, because not only is it still coming and shooting, it's coming now sooner than we thought. This comes to us from Slash Film, who wrote the following. Once again, Marvel's long-awaited Thunderbolts movie has been given a new release date. The good news for those looking forward to this one is that for once, Disney has moved the film up by a couple of months rather than delay it again. Whether or not this date is the one that sticks remains missing, but mark your calendars for May 2nd, 2025, and plan accordingly. That means this movie is hitting theaters in one year and three months. Right, March, April, May? Yeah. yeah. What, less than one year and three months from now, this movie's opening theaters. Now, it's not a major move. It's only a few months that it moved up because it was going to be later in the summer. But still, it, it's not the date change, just a couple months. It's like this is Disney just reaffirming, oh, no, 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 make no mistake, we're we're working on this movie. And this movie is coming. And I got to say, Rob, I'm not excited about, well, it goes without saying, I'm not excited about everything that's coming on Marvel Slate right now. But this is one of the things I am really excited about. And I'm kind of happy to hear about this. What do you think about the date change? And where's your enthusiasm right now for a Thunderbolts? High, low, like where is it right well, now? Well, you know, I'd heard... Uh, during some of the designing Hollywood interviews I've done, that this film was was already, this was really affected by the strike and that they were going to launch into this. Look, I think this movie has a great cast and I think they're going to lean into more of the Red Guardian aspects of it because the snarkiness, I, I think this cast is going to be, I love men and women on mission movies. And I think that's what this is going to do best. And I, I'm, I'm there for it. I'm hoping it's great. I think Marvel, you know, it's funny. I, I think with the transition they've had to make with the things not working, that they're, we're really going to get well-crafted stories. I mean, I'm an optimist about this. And I think with this, it has the potential to be something great because it doesn't have to be some apocalyptic world-ending thing. It can be more like the Dirty Dozen, like there's a singular objective that these characters have to go take out, whether it's a, a base or people or whatever. I, I'm really excited about this movie, and um, I think it can be terrific. I love the cast, man. The cast, is, it, it, could be a, it could be a wonderful ensemble, and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I mean, Imposter was saying something that Jonathan was bringing up earlier. It's like, I was just talking about how David Harbour was the best thing about that movie. I mean, the worst thing was ultimately what they ended up doing with taskmaster yeah which i think they're gonna change that what was the comparison you made jonathan with taskmaster uh deadpool and wolverine right when they oh, just yeah. mal when they, they just, just like yeah just took away all the personality i was like this <clears throat> and the thing is olga kurianko can be a really magnetic performer i really love her i thought she was terrific in quantum of solace do you know she was the runner-up to gal gadot to yeah. Wonder woman yeah i mean she's got charisma to burn and I think that she, uh, I, I take that mask off. She was terrific in the first Hitman movie too. I liked her in that. She's sultry. So She's sultry. got like Bond girl written all over her. I know. Really, actually, I have yeah. a thing for Russians. What can I say? <laughs> all right, guys. With that down, we still got a couple things to discuss here, including the first reactions to Dune 2, which are calling it perfection, masterpiece, a new standard in sci-fi. That and, of course, it's now official a couple of days later than I predicted, but we've now got the official casting for Fantastic Four. We're going to talk about that and a few things more, but before we get to that, we're going to take a quick moment here and thank a couple of sponsors of today's episode of the John Campy Show podcast, our friends at Mint Mobile and Fume. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of this video, 
Mint Mobile. On average, it takes about 30 days for a person to break their New Year's resolution. So if saving money was on your 2024 list, your odds aren't looking that great. Luckily, I have a 100% guaranteed way to save you money this year. Just switch to Mint Mobile. For a limited time, wireless plans from Mint Mobile are $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for $15 a month. I've told you guys many times that after switching to Mint Mobile, I am spending less than a third on my cell bill than I used to with a major carrier. Say goodbye to your overpriced wireless plans, jaw-dropping monthly bills, and unexpected overages. All Mint plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. And don't worry about having to change phones or numbers. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with all your existing contacts. So guys, to get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash Campia. That's mintmobile.com slash Campia. Cut your wireless bills to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash Campia. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video, Fume. Have you ever tried to break a bad habit and it felt like you're climbing uphill? Yeah, well, we've been there too. But here's a breath of fresh air. Fume. It's not about giving up, it's about switching up. Fume takes your habit and simply makes it better, healthier, and a whole lot more enjoyable. Fume is an innovative, award-winning flavored air device that does just that. Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air. Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. And instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses delicious flavors. You get it, instead of bad Bad fume is good. It's a habit you're free to enjoy and make replacing your bad habit easy. Your fume comes with an adjustable airflow dial and is designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting, giving your fingers a lot to do, which is helpful for de-stressing and anxiety while breaking your habit. I'll be honest with you guys, I was a little uncertain about it until my package arrived and I tried it. I couldn't believe how perfectly balanced it is, how fun it is to have in your hands, and how great the actual flavor was. Plus, fume just released a magnetic stand for your fume, so there's no more or losing it around the house. So start the year off right with the good habit by going to tryfume.com slash campia and getting the journey packed today. Fume is giving listeners of the show 10% off when they use my code campia to help make starting the good habit that much easier. And thank you to our friends at Mint Mobile and Fume for sponsoring today's episode of the John Campia Show podcast. All right, guys, with that down, let's move on to this, shall we? Uh, Dune 2 is now just a couple of weeks away. A movie that was supposed to be out months ago, uh, of course, got delayed because of the writer and actor strike. They couldn't have their people going out to promote the film, all that kind of stuff. We got it. They moved it. It's coming out soon. You know, last night, Ann and I went to uh, the local IMAX to watch Dune 1 again. Man, that movie gets better every time I see it. I, I just, I cannot believe what a master's hand Denis Villeneuve has. Like, it's just, it's steeped in this rich mythology, like layers and layers of mythology and character development and political backstabbing and intrigue. It's just glorious. And Dune 2 is going to be like wall-to-wall. I take all that and add wall-to-wall combat and action and thrills and all that kind of stuff. And I cannot wait to see this movie. Well, last night at the... French theater in Paris, the Theater Grand Rex in Paris. Denis Villeneuve went out there and took out his little film, Dune 2, to show it to the first public audience. And the first reactions to that screening have come out. And let's just say they're pretty damn good. Uh, one viewer said, I'm so grateful to be alive just to see this, to have the chance to see a film like this. It is hard to describe. Another viewer said, I wish all future science fiction films the best of luck for the next decade, as this one sets the bar so high. Truly exceptional. Uh, the next wrote, uh, this film stands head and shoulders above 95% of Hollywood productions. The next says, Dune 2 is powerful and epic. There is so much going on. It's an apothesis on every level. I can't believe what I just took in the face. The next one wrote... Wait, wait. Did they have the yeah, popcorn that, bucket? Yeah, that's, were, were, were they using the popcorn bucket? That's Yeah, were they using the Dune popcorn bucket? All up in the face. <laughs> Woo! The next one said, bigger, more epic. 
More intimate. Also talking oh, about the popcorn, popcorn bucket. bucket. <laughs> <laughs> this is definitely not about the movie. Guys, yeah, stick to the, the movie, not the popcorn bucket. Denis Villeneuve delivers his second opus that elevates the Dune saga to the ranks of the greatest modern sci-fi blockbusters. The next one wrote, Denis Villeneuve's promise have been kept. Dune 2 is powerful, epic, and even more grandiose. The next says, I wasn't a big fan of the first Dune. But part two was something else. I was blown away by the film's <laughs> epic and grandiose. But, well, and that's hot. Can bucket. take from the other one. Oh. Okay. Next Don't even says, read this. What's it? You want to read this one? No, I said you shouldn't read no, this read one. It, read it. Okay. okay. Read it, read it. Here we go. Here we go. I don't know what to say after this big slap in the face. <laughs> But long live cinema, long live Denis Villeneuve, and long live the perfection that is this film. Well, at least we One, know. Yeah. <laughs> at least we know what material the thing is made of. Uh, another one, another viewer wrote, Dune Part 2 is just as impressive as Part, part 1, if not more so. It's February, and we've already got the best blockbuster of the year, Unbeatable. And then the final one I'll read here is uh, the perfect film exists and it's called Dune Part 2. Denis Villeneuve, thank you for existing. Uh, you are the king. Uh, and I'll do one last one. Dune 2 is the masterpiece we've been waiting for. The film alternates brilliantly between intimate scenes and the mind-blowing action scenes. More present here than in the first one. Chalamet's charisma shines through. Villeneuve further establishes Dune uh, in the legend. Anyway, it's on and on and on and on people were losing their minds on this people are losing their minds on this uh there was one reporter who said and i can't verify this one there but that uh, zendaya was saying the only bad thing about this movie is that i'll know i'll never be in a movie better than this one for the rest Ooh. of my career oh dang <laughs> wow um I i'll i'll tell you what after the dune movie was done last night dune one that Ann and I watched. They showed like a 15 minute presentation. The writing of the worm. The, yeah. They showed that scene and then they showed a whole bunch of like behind the scenes stuff. But the writing of the worm scene, like my heart was beating fast and I was like, grip it. For, first of all, Javier Bardem as Stilgard is so good. He's so good in this role. Like I was just watching him again last night and even in that last scene, he's like, peace, peace, woman. Peace. I'm just like, this dude, he speaks his lines and they flow like butter. It's so good. And then seeing him talking to Timothy Chalamet and that, uh, uh, the worm writing thing is seriously, nothing fancy. Don't embarrass me. <laughs> like, yeah, I love just, that line. It's great. Oh, oh but my the God. sound design the, in that scene. You know what? Dude. Anne was pointing out the exact same thing. She I was, told you guys when I saw it. The sound design is crazy. Like this thing. And then the, battle sequences coming up in Dune 2 that they showed in the behind the scenes stuff it was you know what it reminded me of this is the first time I think I've ever said this it reminded me of the scale and visceral feel of Braveheart hmm. and and I haven't felt that in a long time it looks great Rob what are you making of of the comments we're hearing coming from the first public audience that saw it. And where's your expectation level right well, now? Well, my, my expectation, this is my most eagerly awaited movie. This and uh, Francis Ford Coppola's Megalopolis. But this, for sure, I mean, you know, I read this book when I was 10 years old for the first time, and I've read it many times since. And, and um, uh, dude, I can't wait for this. And by the way, I just want to point out, on this channel, we have the interview I did with Greg Frazier, the cinematographer. Of Dune. And yep. it was funny because he says in the interview, he says, you know, I just saw Dune 2, like, put together for the first time. And he's like, it's better than the first movie. And it was like, he worked, he shot it, you know, and he was sitting there going, no, 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 you don't understand. And even he, the guy who shot every frame of the movie, was blown away by it. And I'm like, and this was not hyperbole. This was truth. And, of course, the subject matter, there's a lot more going on in this. You've got you've got the Padishah Emperor, you've got... Um, Princess Irulan, you you you've got of course the Har Harkonnens, you've got the Atreides, you've got the Fremen. There's war. Paul becomes he launches his jihad and against don't the Harkonnens. About the Jesuit, yeah, all the all that the Benny Jesuit sisterhood and all that. So it is, and what's really interesting is to now know that they're gonna make Dune Messiah, where Paul Atreides is responsible for the deaths of billions. I just can't wait. I mean, I think that. This was what I was told they were going to do from the beginning, that they were going to make three Dune films, and I think that there was some after the first movie, but now they're back to what they were going to do initially, 
which is going to be, I heard it was going to be Dune, Dune Prophet, then Dune Messiah. So I just Dune 1, 2, 3. But, John, I, I don't think that there's a, my expectations could not be higher. Mm. They're the highest they've ever been. Only because I love my verisimilitude, and Denis Villeneuve in Dune gave us the greatest verisimilitude in any science fiction movie ever made. And I expect that. And I just want to hear what it sounds like because the sound mix in Dune, Man, best I've ever heard. This should be better. Ever since I saw that re-release at the Chinese Theater, I think you got to go to the Chinese Theater. Oh yeah, you, dude. Well, if you guys want to go, like, like I'll bring um, uh, Isabel a worm bucket. Oh, well, okay, so, no, 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 but but no, no bucket. In, in all actuality, I saw Dune uh, at the Steve Ross Theater on the Warner Brothers lot, and it was the the single greatest sounding thing. And Denis Villeneuve knows how to do that. Blade Runner twenty forty nine was the same way. Yeah. Uh, uh, the sound design, and I don't, e I don't even know how they do. I don't know how they record Hans Zimmer's score to make it sound like it's being performed in front of you, like it's un. You you heard it, like oh, at, the, yeah. at the very beginning of Dune, you hear the. Oh, it's, it's oh, chilling. Yeah. It's chilling. What is, what's what's and what's that opening line says? Dreams are messages from the deep, or something. Yeah. Like the first words that come out here, it's like there's something like eerie and oh. and oh i was saying even when um in the first movie when you see the imperial army and you've got like that that officer and he's doing the hand symbols but it's like that rumbling and what are they called again the sac the sadukar Sa sadukar. sadukar warriors yeah, yeah. we are sadukar the emperor commands it shall be done I, I i mean i dude i can't wait and it's almost three hours it's like two hours and 45 minutes dude i'll tell you what i watched that movie again last night and it flew by yeah so i know that like chris has said like oh why it just was kind of like long and whatever but the first the only time she's ever seen it was at home and when i realized that i'm like you know what when you see it at a theater dude it's it, a different experience it is, you're it's in such experience. a mood because you have the sound effects and the music kind of coalesce and so yeah it's kind of long and drawn out but you're into it you know and you know time. some some people just immerse like i i some people will say oh i don't know i i kind of found the first dune boring Different things appeal to different people. Sure. And like if you're not the type of person that like like layers of mythology and stuff like that, like if that doesn't get your blood pumping, then yeah, I could see that. Then this may not be for you. But like I love that kind of stuff. So everything from even the casual conversations with the Fremen house servants mm -hmm. to all that kind of stuff, they were just, just kept adding layers to the mythology. And I was, I eat that stuff up. And now you culminate all that in dune 2 and with the battles and all that kind of oh thing. yeah remember you know i always say this action without narrative purpose is visual noise right action without visual without narrative purpose is visual noise because now you go into like that's why the the choreography of the fight between vader and luke in the emperor's throne room in return of the jedi isn't the best fight choreography in the world but it's the best fight scene ever because of the story that's in there. You know, the, the dynamics. And now when we see the action in Dune 2 being held up by all that rich mythology and story that got told in the first one, it's I think it's just gonna add to the thrill and the epicness of it. Well, it's funny, like you point out, there's two shots in Return of the Jedi of that fight scene. One is when Luke raises up and the camera's fo focusing right at him with his lightsaber. And then the silhouette shot when the camera's underneath the stairwell yeah, yeah, and they're yeah. fighting across. It's a 50 50 of the two of them mm -hmm. fighting. Those two shots alone are all you really need with, with, with the choral score, with William's score rising up. Well, Dune is like that the whole time. You know, you the, the music and the sound effects, you don't know where one ends and the other begins. Yeah. I mean, it is a real triumph of true cinema, that, that film. And I know a lot of people, it doesn't have the 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 easy goodness that a, a great action scene might have but like you said it is it is it's the gestalt of dune it's the overall feel of it all I it's in you talk about movies being experiential events yeah. there is no movie that is more of an experiential event experiential event than dune and i would imagine dune 2 is even more of the same i this goes to 11 cannot wait <laughs> i cannot wait all right guys with that down Let's move on to this, shall we? One of the biggest explosions of glee you've heard in the Marvel fan base was a couple of years ago when Kevin Feige on a Disney live stream announced that Fantastic Four was coming. Now, they lost their director, 
But then they got an equally just as good director in Matt Shackman, who did, of course, WandaVision. He's going to do a great job with this movie. And then for the last four years, it's been speculating who's going to play what. Well, now we know, because this morning, this is reported on Deadline, Marvel got on their social media and posted this picture and said, uh, basically, we've got our Fantastic Four. Happy Valentine's Day for Marvel's first family, Pedro Pascal as Reed Richards, not Dr. Doom, <laughs> as Reed Richards, Vanessa Kirby, Abin Moss Backrack, and Joseph Quinn, who was Eddie in uh, Stranger Eddie Things, uh, are officially now our Fantastic Four. Four. I now listen. These are all names that have been thrown around recently. Uh, there's been a huge evolution. Like there's been three or four people basically confirmed to play Reed Richards until we landed with Pedro Pascal. There were two or three actresses that were practically confirmed before we landed with Vanessa Kirby. We've heard different things for Ben Grimm. We heard different things for Johnny Storm. Uh, I'll be honest with you, his name was, Quinn's name was batted around for Johnny Storm. I honestly didn't think they'd go that way. But I'm thrilled. I, I, I think it's going to be great. I can't wait to see it. Now, there's a couple of interesting things, though, that we get from this. First of all, Eben Moss is going to be a great Ben Grimm. Oh, yeah. He's going to be a great Ben Grimm. I cannot wait. Anyway, one of the things that we learned from this picture is that this movie at least starts as a period piece. Mm -hmm. Because if you zoom in, you know, Rob and I were talking about this earlier today, not only because of the art style, but if you zoom in and look at that magazine that Ben Grimm is holding, Robert Meyer Burnett himself like sent this picture to me. Take a look at that magazine cover. That's it. That's the magazine cover he's looking for from the 1960s. I believe that was from December of 63. There you go. That was, uh, Kennedy was assassinated in November of 63. LBJ took over as president. And this would mean it's, if it does, if this is supposed to be actually Valentine's day, it's, this is on night. This is February 14th, 1964 that we're looking at in this picture. Look at the real to real tape deck on what Herbie's <laughs> face or whatever. Right. Yep. And um, yeah, Herbie down to the robot to Johnny, an early ancestor of Johnny Five. And what's interesting too is that picture. I guess that's of Ben Grimm, or is, it, is it Johnny? Yeah, or, that's Eben. That's Eben Moss. And I think they the, did yeah. that because yeah. the actor's face wasn't it. Right, of course. Know. But but look at that. That is a classic '60s yeah. astronaut photo. It looks very similar to the Apollo and Mercury astronauts that took those photos. Yep. Which means, which means in this picture, the Fantastic Four have already been to space. Yep. And they're already the Fantastic Four in the Fantastic Four comic debuted in 61. So they're already the Fantastic Four here in this picture. They've already been to space. And interestingly enough, the Beatles came to America on February 7th, 1964. Just before this picture. And the number one song in the nation, I looked this up, by the way. The number one song in the nation he at the it. time was I Want to Hold Your Hand. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see the Fab Four here. So this this picture is actually telling us a lot mm -hmm. about the film. It it's there's a lot there. There is a lot there. Now whether or not the movie entirely takes place in that time period, whether it just starts in that time period and then we rush on, whether it's half and half, whether they pull a Captain America, the first Avenger, and it all takes place there until the end, and then they move it over. Well, I'm sure we'll find that out in the coming days and months and stuff like that. But we now know when it's coming out, too. It's new release date. It's swapped release dates with Thunderbolts. It's now coming out in July. So still just a little over a year away, less than a year and a half away. So we're going to get that in uh, next summer. So it's on its way. They got everything up and running and, and ready to go. Now, Rob, before I go over and, and get your thoughts on the now official casting and stuff like that, something I wanted to touch on. Something I wanted to touch on. We've all known that Reed Richards is now, was going to be, uh, or that Reed Richards, that Pedro Pascal was going to be Reed Richards, right? Like, they, they pretty much confirmed that. Of course, SAG did the big leak with reporting that he was about to start working on the movie and all that kind of stuff. So, we all knew, all, all of you guys at home, us here, we knew it was going to be that, and he's that. Now, there are still some people who are not happy with the casting of Reed Richards. 
uh, with Pedro Pascal in the role. And listen, casting a role is going to be one of the big things. Like for everyone, they hear so-and-so, somebody was cast in a role. Some people are going to like it. Some people aren't going to like it. And that's fair, right? Because maybe you don't like the performer or, or whatever reason. I wanted to address something here quick, though. Because there are going to be people out there who don't like Peter Pascal's Reed Richards simply because he doesn't work for them as an actor. And th- and there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing, like, right. There are actors people love that I don't necessarily think are all that great. And there are going to be people out there who look at this and say, you know what? I just don't dig Peter Pascal as an actor. So I don't like this casting. You know what? Totally fair. That that's That's all of us. We've all got actors we like or don't like. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Hopefully, when this movie comes out, he's going to be able to win those of you who don't really like him as an actor over, or maybe he won't. It's all fair. It's the subjectivity of film, and there's nothing wrong with that. But that being said, I got to admit, I can't help but roll my eyes a little bit at the excuses some people make about why they don't want Pedro Pascal in the role. And if you follow me on social media, I posted about this earlier this morning. One of the big objections I've heard from people, not everybody, not everybody, but one of the big objections I've heard from a bunch of people is, he doesn't look like Reed Richards. (laughs) How can he be Reed Richards when he doesn't look like Reed Richards? To which I would want to ask, which Reed Richards are you referring to? Because if you go to the comics, over the decades, you can bring this up, Jonathan, over the decades... Reed Richards has had like 50 different looks. Like they're constantly changing. I mean, there's a couple of things that stay consistent, the white streak in the hair, you know, all that kind of stuff. But for the most part, over the decades, (coughs) Reed Richards has looked dozens of different ways. He's had dozens of different looks. So the point I would want to make to my fellow fans who say he doesn't look like Reed Richards is, well, Considering how often they've changed the look of Reed Richards in the comics, clearly the comics don't think that how Reed Richards looks is sacred. How Reed Richards looks is not sacred to the comics. They don't care what he looks like, so they change it up all the time. And I would even make an argument. I would even make an argument. If you want to bring this picture back up again, Jonathan, that if you kind of mash together all these various looks of Reed Richards... You're not looking too far off from Pedro Pascal. I, I'm, I'm just that's just my my own eyeballs, whatever. But that aside, if the comics don't think the look of Reed Richards is sacred, why should anybody else think it should be in the movie? So I just wanted to throw that out there. That that, that I think the argument, well, he doesn't look like Reed Richards. I think that's a ridiculous argument. That's just me. The second thing that I'll hear some people say is, and I had some people write this to me today, write this exact statement to me today. Pedro Pascal is old enough to be Vanessa Kirby's dad. Too Uh old. And I'm like, "Whoa." well, wait a minute. Do you actually know how old Pedro Pascal and Vanessa Kirby are? They're only 12 years and a couple of months apart. That's not that much. I mean, by a lot of marriage standards today, this is my not... mom and dad were 16 years apart. <laughs> were they? Yeah. Me and my wife are 12 years apart. I mean, it's not that much. Pedro Pascal is 48. And by the way, there are some iterations of Reed Richards where that's younger than what Reed Richards has been in some stories in the comics. But no, Pedro Pascal is not old enough to be Vanessa Kirby's dad. Vanessa Kirby's turning 36 in a bit. It's and and Pedro's 48. It's not that far off. So if you're concerned that he's old enough to be your dad, no, he's not. He, he's not. So I, I don't kind of accept that one. Then there's a the third one. <laughs> and this becomes a subsection of the people who, who complain that he doesn't look like Reed Richards. Because there are some, some, some of those people who say he doesn't look like Reed Richards but what they're really saying is he ain't Caucasian. He ain't Caucasian. Reed Richards has to be through and through mom's apple pie whitey white. In order for Fantastic Four to work, whoever plays Reed Richards has got to be whitey white. 
Like John's tidy whitey's white. He's got to be white. To which I would say two things. One, Rob, you are much more of a student of the Fantastic Four history. Probably know more about Fantastic Four than anybody I personally know. How many stories of the Fantastic Four has the ethnicity of Reed Richards been an important part of the story? Gosh, John, uh, if I think back on that, uh, being I, I would think his ethnicity as somebody from Earth. Yeah, as a, you as know, he is a it's human. Really, been more important, right? He is a human from Earth, and 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 from Terra, from the Soul System. I think that that's probably <laughs> the most important thing about Reed Richards. There you go. Dealing with people like Annihilus in the Negative Zone or whatever, he, he's an Earthling. Earthling. So, but the second thing I would want to point out to this, to, to to my fellow film fans who would say to me, it's really important that Reed Richards be white if, if Fantastic Four is going to work. I would suggest this, and I submit to you that in the past number of reaches of years, they've made a bunch of Fantastic Four movies. And unless I'm mistaken, every single Reed Richards we've had on the screen has been Caucasian. How'd those movies turn out? And now don't get me wrong, I am obviously not suggesting that all those Fantastic Four movies were bad because they had a Caucasian playing role. That would be stupid. Of course I'm not saying that. But anybody who looks at me and says, it's vital that Reed Richards be white, it's like, clearly not. It's clearly not that important because they did him white every single time, and there's no problem if they do him white again. That's fine too, but clearly it has no bearing on whether or not this movie is going to be good. Whether you have Pedro Pascal playing Reed Richards or whether you have Ryan Gosling playing Reed Richards or whether you have Martin Lawrence playing Reed Richards. Martin. <laughs> the clearly, <laughs> since every Fantastic Four movie they've ever done has had Whitey White as Reed Richards and they've all sucked this isn't going to be the determining factor as to what... Now, having him not be white isn't going to make the movie good either, right? It ain't. But clearly, it's not the defining factor as to whether or not this movie's going to be good. And if all you care about, like many film fans say, is make us, give us a good movie, It's if you're being honest about that, if you're being honest when you say, all I want is a good movie, well, then you should have no problem with this casting. Again... If you're not a fan of Pedro Pascal's acting and his acting doesn't work for you and it's not believable for you and you're just not a fan, I, I get that. I accept that. It's, that's a totally reasonable thing. We all have actors we do and, and do not like and it doesn't work. But the reasons of because he doesn't look like Reed Richards, well, that obviously isn't a valid thing. He's old enough to be Vanessa Kirby's dad. No, he's not. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess biologically, maybe there could be a 12-year-old whose uh, who's swimmers could do the job. But really, it's it's he's not traditionally in our understanding of being old enough to be somebody's dad. No, he's not. There's like 12 years separating, 12 years and a few months separating them. And then the notion that, I mean, this movie can only work if it's a White Reed Richards. Well, they've done White Reed Richards and it hasn't worked. So clearly, that's not the tipping point. That's not going to be the defining thing about whether this movie's good or not. Yeah. So this movie's going to be good or it's going to be bad, but it ain't going to be good or bad because you had a white Reed Richards or not white Reed Richards. Anyway, overall, I, I really do like this casting. Not all my number one fan casting um, things. They wouldn't all have been my top choice, but I sit back and I look at this and I'm like, this looks pretty good to me. Rob, first of all, I know you love the image and you've been saying for a long time. You have said for a long time, you think there's going to be a big period piece aspect of this. Yes. Clearly, you were right. Uh, so what do you think about what we see in the image, and what do you think about the casting? Well, first of all, the thing that I've objected to about Reed Richards is he was always too young. You know, to me— Yeah, the Reed, Muppet Babies, the Fantastic Four Babies. Yeah, I mean, I, needed, I wanted a Reed Richards that was in his 40s, somebody that you could a grown believe— up. A grown-up that had a scientific background. Always, I always thought Sue Storm was younger than Reed a little bit. You know, and and because Johnny Storm is particularly young, you know, but not like a teenager. I was kind of thought of thought of him. You know, I thought Chris Evans actually was a great Johnny Storm. I thought he was a wonderful. He Johnny was a great Storm. Johnny Storm. I, like I thought him. that was great casting. But I really like this. To me, the funny thing is, for me, Pedro Pascal as an actor was the best he's ever been for me in Game of Thrones. 
mm. because he burned charisma. He was fun. He was kind of unleashed. And I feel that the roles hit that he's been playing now, even as Joel on uh, Last of Us, he's a little reserved. He he's not. I mean, obviously he's supposed to be. That's not exactly right. A That's happy, what the character calls a happy for. show. Right. And I think that the Fantastic Four, by definition, has to be a little bit more upbeat. So if you combine Joel and his role on Thrones, you're going to get the kind of Reed Richards. Because I see Reed Richards as a very serious guy that also has kind of a hidden sense of humor, that he can bring it out when he needs to be. This movie has to be, I mean, I see this as really embracing the 60s, the same way we saw the World's Fair in Captain America, the first Avenger. The Fantastic Four, I wouldn't be surprised, John, if this Fantastic Four isn't even on the MCU's Our Earth. What is it? 616? 616. I wouldn't be surprised if this is a alternate, maybe on a different Earth, that has more of that 60s Tomorrowland vibe where the future's here, but it's a, it's the it's not so steeped. I mean, it's With mostly B. Johnson. History. Well, yeah, I mean, something like that. And and clearly, I would love it if the Fantastic Four did go into the negative zone. They just, We talked about this when Quantum, Quantum Mania was coming out. Yeah. That what if the Fantastic Four had been in we prison? Thought that. We thought actually we, they might run into the Fantastic Four. Yeah, like they were yeah. prison in the yeah. Quantum Realm. It would not surprise me if the Fantastic... And that's why they're gone. Yeah. You know, they, the Fantastic Four, and the reason nobody really talks about them is they were anachronism, a period piece, and they were astronauts or these people, they were fantastic, but then they disappeared. And then they show up now, which leads into Secret Wars or Avengers or whatever. I would love that because that's what happened to Captain America. Total period piece, and then the end of the movie took place in the present day. You know, and, and it would be very funny because then you could have a great relationship between, well, no longer Steve Rogers, I guess. That's kind of a bummer. But... It would be funny to see Reed and Steve together talking about what it's like to be men out of time. Well, but something like that. I still think that Hank Pym, Michael Douglas, oh yeah, has a place with this because he would have been a kid yes. and knowing about this, and they would have been an inspiration for him. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, like like a Reed Richards could have been a hero of his. a hero, right? And we just haven't heard. There's no reason why we would have heard about the Fantastic oh, Four. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, In the MCU, we've only got back to what the '90s and Captain Marvel. Yeah, and I then mean, we've seen different historical correct events. Correct me in, if I'm wrong, but I don't think. I'm just going to pull a name out of my ass here, so correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm. But I don't think Muhammad Ali has ever been mentioned in the MCU. But clearly, Muhammad Ali was a real figure in that sure. universe in the past. But they just because they never mentioned him doesn't mean he wasn't an important figure sure. in that. Universe. And I think that that solves a lot of problems too. That they because they were these figures. Obviously, they were they were famous astronauts because we have the astronaut picture on the wall, and so that makes a whole lot of sense because nobody will care. If they were existing in the 60s and came back, the tone of the Fantastic Four can also come back with them. So they'd kind of have this, oh, shucks. Yeah. You know, back in the day, they'd be more like the Mercury astronauts, steadfast and forthright, and rah-rah America. And they could bring an energy that we don't have in the MCU that I think is sorely needed. Let me ask you this question, Rob. I, I, that I Chuck Yeager right stuff, bud. But, you know, I, I was in a, a conversation about the Pedro Pascal uh, casting. Now, this was before they confirmed it. And we were talking about the the merits of it and, and all that kind of stuff. And somebody, somebody I know said to me, they said, the thing about the Pedro Pascal casting, if that's what they do, it's not so much that they found the perfect Reed Richards. They needed to find, because I know this goes into one of your theories. They said they needed to find that you could, uh, a, an actor like a Robert Downey Jr., that you could build a cinematic universe around. Because I, this is my friend saying this, I think Fantastic Four is going to become a very central centerpiece for the MCU as they start to move forward. And Reed Richards is going to be one of those, what Steve Rogers and Tony Stark were to the MCU he was saying, I think Reed Richards is going to be one of those centerpieces now moving forward. And so when they were looking to cast him, they needed to find an actor with, I don't like using this word, but gravitas Ooh. that you can actually build a universe around and they can carry it. What do you think about that? I, I think you're absolutely right. You know, and the thing is, Pedro Pascal, you know, even as the Mandalorian, he hasn't, because we don't see him enough. You just hear his voice. Yeah. To me, when I saw him in Game of Thrones, I'm like, that guy's a star. 
because he was so charismatic and so much fun. Whereas he hasn't been allowed. I mean, I liked him. He was in uh, Equalizer 2. You know, he was one of the, the leaders. He was of, also in The Kingsman 2. <laughs> yeah, he was in The King. I, I mean, but I think that, like, they know the one thing that Marvel has always done quite well, with maybe one or two exceptions, is casting. And I'm sure they had chemistry reads with all these actors. They put them together. They, they didn't pull the trigger until they were sure. Because, look, this is, this is truly, to me launching the next phase of the mcu because this is these are marquee marvel characters and while you know going to the eternals and shang chi none of them were ever going to be at the forefront of the mcu moving forward these can be if they're right and i think everybody knows like tim story's fantastic four movies were okay yeah yeah uh, <laughs> yeah i mean they had they had their upsides they they had yeah. their they had their upsides but this chemistry the four of them have to be fun it's there and they've got they're looking at the incredibles they're going the incredibles was the fantastic four movie that we need to emulate because i know it's an animated film and i know it's brad bird's brainchild but it was essentially fantastic four they need to give us that kind of fun but also the kind of cosmic adventure that you would expect from both the john byrne and jonathan hickman run of the comics and by the way like with this casting they just put in two actors who uh, as far as Peter Pascal was just nominated for Best Lead Actor in a Drama Series at the Emmys, and Evan Moss Backrock just won Best Supporting Actor in a Comedy Series. So you, you like, they've got that momentum coming. And Vanessa Kirby, I mean, Vanessa Kirby's just Vanessa Kirby. I mean, come on. And Joseph Quinn's got a lot of potential, man. Like, I, everybody I fell in about, love with him. I was happy about that casting. Yeah, I mean, everybody fell in love with him in, in Stranger Things. He looks yeah. like a younger Robert Downey Jr. when he does bit. certain I mean, things. these actors all bring with them a certain amount of gravitas, and Ben Grimm has to be funny. Yes, and so, Eben Moss is great. And the other thing about Eben Moss was he was already in the Mouse House, right? He just did Andor. Right. Right, so they, they were already familiar with him. He's part of the family already. I think he is... An inspired choice. I, I think he's gonna be great. I think if they want any elements of this man, this monster, he can convey oh, that hurt. Oh, totally. And he has to go up against the Hulk. <laughs> well, you it's know they're not gonna have time. the Hulk in this movie, <laughs> I know, right? I know, I know but, but no, because it's clobbering time, John. I tell you, it's my, clobbering I time. I can't remember which one was first, but my two first comics I ever got was a Wolverine versus Hulk. And one with the cover of the Thing versus the Hulk, and yeah, you know it reminds me. I was I think I was watching Comics Explained, where they they did this one story where, you know, uh, Bruce or Hulk walks into a bar where Thing is, and like they, it's a serious serious thing, right? And they're basically talking. The conversation is Hulk was basically letting me know, like you know, all those times we fought, you know, I was kind of holding back, right? <laughs> and things like yeah, I always knew you were. Like, I always knew you were. And, like, blah, 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 which is pretty cool. But, yeah. I listen, it ain't going to happen in this movie. No. I would no. love to see Hulk versus. There is thing. no Hulk in this movie yet. No. Not there's there's only a, a family barbecue attending, Hawaiian shirt wearing, uh, green banner. But I would love to see Thing versus. Thing. But let me ask you this quick. Remember, I said this could be 60s for the first five minutes, then they bring it into modern times. It could be half and half. It could be more like First Avenger, where he, they don't come into the modern MCU until later. What do you think that's going to be? Do you think it's going to be majority in the 60s, majority modern day, split down the middle? How do you think? I do. I, I, I would imagine, well, I, I think it's going to be, obviously, it'll start out in the 60s because that'll be a lot of fun. Show us the Marvel Universe in that period of time, which we've never seen before. Uh, and you know who's at that period of time as well? Young Professor Xavier. Perhaps, yeah. you know, you never know. I'm just saying X-Men first class. I'm not saying that because that was the same period of time, but I'm not saying that's what's going to happen because I don't think they might give us a cameo or something. But I think uh, that that era, the the hopeful optimism of the space race, the dawn of the space race, the Mercury astronauts now were were the they're they're at the fantastic the Fantastic Four as characters of the 60s. I mean, there's got to be a Fab Four Fantastic Four scene when they like meet and know each other uh, another question for you though what are the chances that the reality this movie takes place in is the one that photon ends up in at the end of the marvels with beast 
in it. What what if what if that, that this movie takes place in that world oh. and then culminates with them uh, coming over? I love that idea because that would explain, and then for sure we'll get some kind of an X Men cameo because i mean i i don't know i mean it all comes down to where they're leading up to secret wars the new avengers i could definitely see that happening because you know hank mccoy is like old so the same kind of thing you've got that you're playing with the timeline i mean it's a long it's a it's a pretty big stretch but i definitely could see that happening and i think you might be right and plus look you you start in the 60s you go into whatever realm they go into you have a cosmic adventure space-time continuum time dilation you could do whatever and they come back to earth and they're like where are we it's 2025 it's very exciting it, you know i will I, I should point out that i know we've gone on this a long time but I, I should point out this i got to admit i was kind of surprised by how they announced this like the fact that it came across, it came out as this social media post. Like I, I kind of half expected that. Well, I mean, you know what I said before. I said I, I said a couple of weeks ago. I expect we're going to have the Fantastic Four announcement by Super Bowl, not necessarily at the Super Bowl, but by Super Bowl. But I expected something like that—that that they would do a, a special commercial at at Super Bowl, or they would do a special Disney live stream, or. They would wait. I didn't think they would wait till July for Comic Con, but I thought they might do something like that, right? I was kind of surprised that they decided to do the very low key post on Instagram. Here's our uh, yeah. here's our fantasy. But I mean, they did cool things like the Marvel logo in this post is the Cinerama logo. Yeah, you know, like the word Cinerama is written out, but as Marvel, which I thought was cool. And again, like the Cinerama, Cinerama began in the fifties. This is Cinerama came out in the fifties, but like the Cinerama Theater in L.A., I believe, opened in the early sixties. And you know, I thought that was very cool that they did that. And there's a lot in this post that I just really enjoyed, and it reminded me of of, of like the Criterion Collection, right? You yeah. know, again, and as the when they would they would put out a funny graphic, and you're supposed to guess what they're going to put out for the year. I mean, I think that's kind of they took that from this. Even the even the uh, fashion of their costumes, yeah, in this yeah, you could see that a lot. Well, uh, listen, guys, we can't waste any more time talking about this because the important thing that Madam Webb comes out yeah. today. Oh, so God. we got to get to the live question so Ray and I can get over to the theater to watch us some webby goodness. Yes. Uh, listen, but before we get to your live questions, we're going to take a second here and thank another sponsor of today's episode of the John Campy Show podcast, a sponsor that might not be too familiar to Pedro Pascal, our friends at Harry's. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video, Harry's. You know, guys, in order to start the John Campia show, I had to leave my high paying corporate job in order to set myself up to be happier and enjoy more personal success. Because sometimes to get what you want, you have to challenge the status quo and blaze your own trail. And that's exactly what the folks at Harry's did. You see at Harry's, they saw customers getting ripped off by questionable products in the shaving industry and decided to do something better. Harry's decided to pave their own road by making beautifully designed razors for a fraction of the price of the other big brands. Except Exceptional products, honest prices. That's Harry's. I have fallen in love with Harry's from their foaming shaving gel that feels just luxurious on the skin to their incredible razor that feels just as good in the hand as it does going over your skin. They've got rich lathering skin softening body wash and scents like redwood, wildlands, and stone. You see, Harry's provides German engineered blades made in their own factory that stay sharp longer. You can get a five blade razor, weighted handle, foaming shave gel, and a travel cover for just three bucks at harrys.com slash campia. Don't settle for the status quo. Blaze your own trail with Harry's. Get started with a $13 trial set for just $3 at harrys.com slash campia. That's harrys.com slash campia for a $3 trial set. And thank you to our friends at Harry's for sponsoring today's episode of the John Campia Show podcast. <laughs> Madam Webb, all right. Guys, let's get on to the most important part of the show here today, which is your live questions here, shall we? Jonathan, what are we starting off with? Dwayne Fernandez says, hey, guys, have you seen the new Godzilla v. Kong trailer, which we do? Nope, haven't yeah. seen it. Is it any good? Oh, my God. X-Kong. <laughs> X-Kong, Godzilla, X-Kong. Yeah, yeah not, again. They're no longer fighting each other. It looks stupid. 
and also awesome at the same time. I, I, I can't wait to watch this movie. I got to tell you. All right, what's next? Sanchez guy says, hey, guys, wanted to wish you all a happy Valentine's Day. How are Thank you so much. You? By the way, um, let me see if I can bring this up here. I got to share with you guys. Did you guys see the um, uh, the Valentine's Day card Anne gave me? Oh, what? What'd you give? Yeah. Uh, let me. I laughed out loud. This is the Valentine's Day card that Anne gave me today. I love you like a back alley hooker loves crack. <laughs> <laughs> and I um, I wrote on my social media post, I said, if you really want to know and understand my wife's personality, this was her choice of Valentine's Day cards for me. That tells you everything you a need to know choice it is. about so, Anne's personality. That's a great way to tell you she does crack. Uh, all right, what's next? <laughs> Dan Fisher with the two-parter. Uh, I know announcing the, F uh, the Fantastic Forecast is huge, but it's been rumored for so long it just doesn't feel like news, which is upsetting. I love the poster and logo. It gives me major 60s vibes. I think and hope uh, this could be a period piece, and one of the cast being named Kirby just feels right. Ah, that's yeah, that's true. A little Kirby, appropriate. But, but I mean, but here's the thing. the We all know who's going to be the Fantastic Four has evolved over the past year or two. Yeah. Right? Adam Driver was definitely going to be Reed Richards for a while. Jodie Comer had come really close to signing their deal. She was in talks. They, they came really close to signing the deal for her, her being Sue. We had a dude from You. I always forget his name, but the guy from the from the Netflix show You was really close to being Reed Richards. Uh, one or two other actors had been like kind of lined up to be the Ben Grimm and stuff like that. So it's evolved. But what we have learned as film fans is that we always end up being surprised when the final uh, casting gets announced, right? So the fact that it ended up being the four people that lately we've heard it was going to be is almost a surprise in and of itself. Because it's there's always these fan speculations about casting, and inevitably there's always a curveball thrown in there that nobody saw coming. And it was kind of surprising it turned out exactly the way we thought lately but again who was going to be in the fantastic four has evolved a lot over the last year or so but i agree with you man i i i love the cast i really do not all necessarily wouldn't be the first people that i would have cast but i love it and i think it's going to be great all right what's next reggie phoenix says superman legacy fantastic four jurassic world next july could be stacked if mm. all stays the same right now who would you see winning the box office fantastic four jurassic world <clears throat> jurassic world yeah I, and it's, it's something new. It's it's a new it's a new iteration of, of Jurassic World. Kingdom of the cast, Jurassic World. Kingdom of the Jurassic World. By the way, not being directed by the John Wick director. Now, that was weird. Jurassic they announced X he was going to be the director two days later. Not going to be the director. That that's not a good look on Universal. But <clears throat> the reality is, not a lot of people read Fantastic Four. Um, and while I think it's going to be big. It seems like no matter how good or not good the recent Jurassic World movies have been, they all make over a billion dollars. So now I reserve the right to change my guess once we see Fantastic Four trailers and get a gate, because who knows, maybe Fantastic Four trailer breaks the Deadpool record for most views ever in history of a trailer. Maybe then, but for now, Rob, I'm going to say I think probably Jurassic World. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I think so, probably. <laughs> I mean, again, it all comes down to if the movies are good. Yeah. It's hard. I mean, and we're not guess we're not predicting which one we think will be the better movie. We're just no. saying which one will, might win the box. I office. would say based on previous performance, Jurassic World. You know, kids love dinosaurs, John. <laughs> they sure and do. Kids love dinosaurs that eat people even more. So, I would imagine when uh, time has passed and there's more dinosaurs on Earth, more people will get eaten, which means bigger box office. I'd say now, Fantastic Four to me tracks around like Ant Man or Ant Man Two numbers. Yeah, because look, Fantastic Four has a big hurdle to climb in that we've had three Fantastic Four movies in recent years that just weren't all great. They were all bad. And yeah, the, yeah they, they so it, it has to surmount that hurdle. And also, let's face it, the MCU ain't what it used to be either. It's no spring chicken. So it's, I mean, I know that this is the first family of Marvel and all that, but I don't think that the general movie going population is going to be particularly interested in Fantastic Four. It, I mean, it, it, in terms of coming out with a banger trailer, that first trailer that Fantastic Four is going to come out with, that's going to be key. Right. And now, you might 
be wondering, well, okay, if the general audience of first isn't really going to be all that into Fantastic Four, why make the movie? Because it's not about the first Fantastic Four movie. It's about building it. And if you like, and it's okay. If the first Fantastic Four movie doesn't do great at the box office, that's okay as long as the movie itself is great and they can build on that. Yeah. Then they're perfectly fine. All right, what's next? Johnny Got Lost says, oh, sorry, let me scroll down a little bit. That F4 62525 release date, the same as Superman. Superman is actually July 11. Yeah, and, it's a couple weeks separated. And Fantastic Four is July 24. It's going to be a good month, they're man. They're two yeah. weeks apart. It's going to be a great month. I cannot wait for Superman Legacy. I cannot wait for this Fantastic Four. It's going to be a good month. All right, what's next? AL writes, thoughts Larry David attacking Elmo on today's show? Well, that happened a while back, but it was also a comedy bit. Yeah. He he didn't didn't it's exactly something Larry David would do. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> and he didn't attack him. All he did was grab his face. I mean, it wasn't like Harrison Ford destroying an entire Lego Millennium Falcon on a talk oh, show. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, he did that? Yeah. Boy, that was painful. All right, what's next? Oh, this one's for Robert. I'm assuming happy birthday, Robert. <laughs> It's not your birthday, it's is not, it? It's not my yeah. birthday. First of all, it's Irene Johnson, it's, Jobson, it's good to have you here. I, Irene was in the hospital. No, oh. there's this joke that started uh, yeah, on you. my own show where people just started sending me super chats and wishing me a happy birthday. It is not my birthday. My birthday is May 15th, so save your shekels till then. Right. But it's very funny, say, Irene. Because your birthday's after CinemaCon, right? So Yes. Uh, yes. All right, <laughs> what's next? But thank right. you, Irene. AL has a couple more here. Uh, I've realized that a lot of sequels have the same problem, getting too silly. Examples like F9, Venom 2, Babe, Pig in the, or, uh, Babe the Pig 2, uh, Gremlins 2, uh, Batman and Robin, F Thor 4. Why do you think this is? They just jumped the shark, I guess. Well, but then there are a lot of sequels that do the opposite, right? I mean, sequels are like anything else. They're you'll get a whole entire mix look every time you do a sequel what you try to do is lean into the strengths and lean away from the things that didn't work so much but but sometimes and often it works right often it works but a lot of times it doesn't like because sometimes filmmakers take away the wrong lessons from a movie they they focus on the wrong things that they need to lean into or move away from uh taika watiti is a great example of that with thor ragnarok which was perfect balance thor ragnarok was a perfect balance of the lighthearted and the serious and that movie was beloved but and taika's great but he took the wrong lesson away from it he thought oh let's make it even more thor ragnarok and disrupted the balance and went way too much into the silly and Hopefully now Marvel looks at that and learns the lesson and course correct. So it happens. same thing happened to Star Trek Five: the, uh, the Final Frontier. The voyage home was very funny, with the whales going yep. back. To, and and so they took Shatner's story that was a very heartfelt, emotional story, and they had to inject all the humor in it, and it's completely unbalanced. What what's the line Bone says? When the Almighty's talking to you, you don't ask for his ID. Yeah. <laughs> he says that the line. You don't ask for his. What does ID. God need with a starship? Yeah, question, <laughs> what does God need with a starship? All right, what's next? Closer. Uh, is it Monkey Pants is next? Yes, yeah, Spider-Man 2 is the best superhero movie fight for me. Um, Oh, oh wait a second, P bring that up again? Fight for you? Or no, movie, fight me. Oh, fight me. Oh, uh, listen, okay, yeah, yeah. Listen, there's, uh, first of all, fight you implies that uh, it's our job to convince you you're wrong, and it's not. Uh, but... Spider-Man 2, like I was saying this on open mic yesterday, for a period of time, for a number of years, for a lot of fans, Spider-Man 2 was considered by many to be the best comic book movie ever made. Uh, there are those who still think it belongs in the conversation, if not at the top of the list, and maybe still somewhere in the top 10. It is a truly, you know, it's one of those rare comic book movies, Rob, because there's not a lot of them. One of those rare comic book movies that happened before the new golden age of comic book movies. Right. You know, with the dawn of the MCU and everything. That still completely stands up. I mean, that movie is marvelous. Like, just fantastic. I don't think it's in the conversation of the greatest comic book movie ever made anymore, but I acknowledge it's great. That's why I still say, when we express our frustrations at Sony, like I did a lot yesterday... Um, <laughs> Me too. It's important to, to <laughs> still keep in mind that even with all the Marvel Spider-Man movies, Sony has made the three best Spider-Man movies. 
with Spider-Man 2 cross the Spider-Verse into the Spider-Verse. That's, that's obviously up to opinion. But to me, and, uh, they've made the and Spider-Man 2 is definitely one of those. It's great. Yeah, I, you need people that really understand this. If I was working at Sony right now, if I could do anything, John, I would green light a new Andrew Garfield Spider-Man and I would completely adapt the ultimate Spider-Man story that's running now. It would blow people's minds. Is that the one where he didn't know he was Spider-Man? That's and right. He got the... He's never been Spider-Man. He's he's married right. to Mary Jane. He's older. Ben... Uh, ben is Par the head uh, of... Uh, what was the chief editor-in-chief of... Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a totally different universe. Yeah, Uncle Ben and Jay, Jay Jonah Jay were Jones, best James, friends. Yep. That's right. Yep. And it's great. Yeah. Thank you, Lael Rockwell, for telling me to read it. All right. What's next? Monkey Pants is back and says, will you watch Chris Duckman's movie when it releases? Oh, well, I'm sure I'll check it out when, when he gets... I, I mean, no, he's been working on that for a few years. I'm I really excited that I'm not Stuckman's, sure how close he is to having it done. It's It's done. He's oh, pretty it? much okay. done. Yeah, you know he crowd. He he he's an author. He's a published author. He uh, crowdfunded that movie, raised the money, and 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 went out and made it. I'm hoping. I'm I expect it to be great. I'm looking forward to. Yeah, it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to checking that it he out. went out and made a movie. Congratulations. All right, what's next? I mean, is uh, next. So Pedro's shooting Last of Us season two, Mando and Grogu, uh, and Fantastic Four all this year. I mean, we know the first two don't require as much filming uh, time for him specifically, but still busy, busy man. Yeah, yes, but we as film fans often have this idea that if it takes them a year to make a movie, that means the actor is working a year yeah, on the movie. No. No. no, like the the people who probably work the least amount of time on any movie is the actors. <laughs> like with all the people who put in like months and months and months and months and sometimes years of blood, sweat and tears, the people who put in the least amount of effort is probably the actors. Yep. Um, they go, they show up for five weeks, nine weeks, whatever, and then they can go. And there's even times they can go and be on set for three weeks. Then they'll be shooting other stuff for the next month or so. And then they come back for another three or four weeks. Like it's, so it's actually not that busy. If you have a full-time job at home, you're busier than Pedro Pascal is going to be this year. <laughs> I would imagine shooting The Last of Us is the thing that's going to take the longest. Absolutely. That will 100% be the thing. Because, that takes you know, on a regular time. hour long TV show, they shoot for eight days, usually on television. But I'm sure for an HBO show, it's probably two or three times that, times 10. Yeah. So that's the one that's going to take the most time. Um, because of the nature of Mandalorian, even, he probably won't even have to be there for half the scenes that his character's in the movie. Right. Because he's he only was on set, I think they said for season two for like two days. I mean, so he'll he'll be fine. Pedro will be fine. All right, what's next? Richard K says, Have you seen the new Godzilla Kong trailer now officially most anticipated movie of the year by far? Again, glorious in its ridiculousness. Hundred percent. All right, what's next? Michael D'Souza says, Love you guys. Thanks for all you do. Oh, thank you. It's always nice when somebody just wants to write in to say something uplifting. Thank you for that, man. I appreciate that. Um, All right, what's next? Ronetta W with a twenty dollars super chat. Thank you, Ronetta. Says, "What up, y'all? I'm so glad they are going retro with the Fantastic Four movie. We need something fresh and different. And I, for one, am looking forward to it. Please, please let this have good writing and character development." Well, look, we already know they got a really solid director who understands this world and understands this universe. I mean, what he did with WandaVision, I still think WandaVision is the gold standard of what Disney Plus is capable of doing. Uh, they certainly don't execute on that level all the time, but at least WandaVision was there. Uh, I, I think they're going to do... I, I I just think Kevin Feige... I don't know if there's any other project on Marvel's roadmap that Kevin Feige has had more circled than Fantastic Four. I really don't. So I, I expect great things. They may not deliver, yeah. but for now I'm going to expect great yeah. things. And most of... It just dawned on me, most of WandaVision is a period piece. Yep. So Yeah. In you a know, way. In a way, in a way. Yeah, yeah. In a way. A I, I'm still really curious to find out how much of this film will be a period piece. And when they bring them and thrust them into the movie. You know, I've age. often said that why didn't they look back at Iron Man 1 as a template for starting over with four, uh, uh, phases 4 and 5? I think looking at Captain America, the first Avenger, is not a bad idea for a Fantastic Four. And where a lot of it is, the majority of it's set in the past because they, they have more freedom in a way. Because they're not saddled with all the baggage of the MCU. Yeah. All right. What's next? <laughs> what is Ray, Ray laughing at? Ray is, 
He's working on some artwork. Oh, that animation? And is he still working on that animation? killing himself with his own work. It's pretty he's hilarious. Cracking, Ray is cracking himself up over there. It's pretty funny. <laughs> Maybe we'll be able to show it to you sometime what it is he's working on. Uh, Logan right, Block next? says, hey, John and crew, just saw the Superman and Fantastic Four releasing, releasing the same month in 25. Will be a great month for superhero movies. Not just those two. There's like some other viewers point out, there's a couple of really big... Like, look, it's been a, a dry... There have been some great movies, some great, 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 great movies, but it's it's been a dryish six months or so, so right? And we're gonna get an just a flood of content as we head into the end of 2024, beginning of 2025, especially and then we get to the summer 2025. We are we're in for a ride, my friends. We're in for a ride. All right, what's next? <laughs> Is Ray still choking over that? Dude, I saw more of it. I just can't breathe. I, thought was, I heard him choking. Uh, it's moved on from popcorn. I literally heard him choking. It's Oh, no. It's moved on from popcorn. It's moved on from popcorn. Yeah. Oh, no. CM Waters, film enthusiast. Um, <laughs> great casting for Fantastic Four, but wasn't announced. Wasn't the announcement itself a little underwhelming? Was, just, was expecting a video or a stage presentation, not just a card? I brought that up myself a little bit earlier. Like, I'm a, a little surprised that they announced it with just a quick social media post. Now, look, at the end of the day, the result is the same. Whether they whether they booked the stage at Caesar's Palace and brought out the four actors on stage with flying cats and, and confetti falling from the thing and, you know, dune buckets for everybody in the audience or just drop a quick social media post, the result is the same. Here we are on the show talking about it. Now we all know about it. Yeah, and uh, they didn't have to I fly honestly, everybody to Vegas. I honestly kind of love it that they did this way with the card and me it's... too. Most of the time, it's just announced on deadline. Yeah, yeah. I, I now, really look, like it. If CinemaCon was tomorrow and not a couple of months away, if Comic Con was two weeks ago, or uh, a WonderCon or something, then I I I surmise they probably would have done it at one of the events. But they're ready to release the thing now. There's nothing in the immediate vicinity of now. So, yeah, go ahead. Drop it as a social media post. But, uh, all right, what's next? Matt Boyle with a $20 super chat. Um, do you guys have a favorite opening song from any James Bond movie? And do you have a musician you would love to see doing a, a song for James Bond? Uh, I would love to see uh, David Draymond from Disturbed uh, to give it a go. That doesn't seem like a fit to me. But... Yeah, I don't know. But then but, I mean, again... Hey, Neither does one of the names I'm going to mention. Duran Duran, View to a Kill. Yeah. I, I actually, I really like the opening of that song. Paul McCartney and Wings, I, Live and Let Die. Yeah, and I'm going to yeah. say this, Alicia Go Keys, right. Jack White, Another oh. Way to Die from Quantum of Solace. Adele's... Um, For that movie and uh, of the new... Skyfall? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I I, I actually love the um the new iteration like all those songs that had come out for those. Yeah, my favorite is Carly Simon's "Nobody Does It Better." Nobody does it better. I mean, Lulu, Mouth Golden Gun. My great. You one. know, um, it, it, there's more good Bond songs than there are bad Bond songs. Like, uh, "Writings on the Wall," Sam Smith. Yeah, I'm Bill, sorry, listen, no. Billy Eilish's was also pretty darn yeah. good. That was yeah. a good one too. Came but out, I'd like, love to see another. I'd love to see another. Uh, uh, like a. Uh, uh, you know, like Goldfinger, like a Shirley Bassey belting it out. Adele was close. Skyfall had that vibe, yeah. you know? All right, what's next? Mr. Godzilla. Uh, Godzilla X Kong, New Empire. Here's hoping there's some Easter eggs or full-on surprise appearances in classic Godzilla monsters. With my, uh, with my name, how could I not comment? March being my birthday, it's going to rock. Rock. Here's the thing. I think... The majority of the movie going audience that's going to go see this movie will have no idea who any of the classic monsters are. And and the the thing the piece of information that I back that up with is true hardcore old school Godzilla fans went out to see Godzilla minus one. Godzilla minus one only made like seventy million dollars, or did it hit the hundred million dollar mark? It did. Uh, yeah, it did. Oh, so it hit the hit under hundred million. Still, let me see. Tiny, right? They're not hoping for a hundred million dollars from this movie. They're hoping for five hundred million dollars, six hundred million dollars. So I don't know how impactful okay. cameos of what one hundred six. One hundred six. So I'm not sure how impactful the uh, like quick cameos of the other kinds of monsters 
would be. I'm, I'm just, but I'm sure hey, the Godzilla King of the Monsters gave us a lot. Yeah, I'll tell you what I want to see, especially at the end when they're all kind of coming together. I want to see the controller from Godzilla versus the Astro Monster from Planet X and those flying saucers. If that happens, I will be dead. My head will explode <laughs> from joy. <laughs> Give me the controller. We're not going to get the controller, but if that happened, I would be very excited. I want to see giant Spider-Man. That that, uh, that, that would be awesome, of too. Godzilla. They yep. could totally do that. <laughs> they could. Cross the streams. All right, what's next? Chubb says, John Wick, Jack Reacher, Jason Bourne, The Equalizer, James Bond, fight to the death, no weapons, who walks out alive? Um, I lean, well, is it this Jack Reacher, this monster? Yeah, I, I would have to say Jack Reacher. Or Bourne. I mean, just. Bourne would be great, but I still have to go with Jack Reacher. Like, and I'd say the Jack Reacher you have to go with is the Allen one, because he's the one who more, he, he more resembles the Jack Reacher from the book. Yeah. Tom, by the way, I love Tom Cruise's first Jack Reacher. Jack Reacher 2, Never Stop, Never Stopping, or whatever it was called, <laughs> was not so good. What? It wasn't as good. But that first Tom Cruise Jack Reacher movie, even though he looks nothing like what Jack Reacher is supposed to look like, that was a great movie. I don't care what anybody says. And, man, he kicked a lot of ass in that one, too. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to say Jack Reacher. And if it's no weapons, straight up in a locked room, hand-to-hand, -hand, I got to go Jack Reacher. All right. What's All right. next? Uh, Kyler Hoddick says, did you finish Mr. and Mrs. Smith? Thoughts on it? No. I'm like, and because it's it's one of those shows Ann and I are watching together. And, okay. I got I got to bring this up here. Hold on a second. Um, Ann and I, it's a show we watch together, so I have to wait until we think. And, but the problem is we got sidetracked. Oh, no. We got sidetracked. Here's what happened. Don't bring this up yet. Yeah. But I did talk about this on, on Open Mic yesterday. So Anne and I were, what were we watching? I, we were watching the newest episode of um, Night Country, of True Detective Night Country, which, by the way, whoo, did you see the latest episode? Oh, yes. That ending? <gasps> anyway. And so it ends. And so I'm just flipping. I, I haven't really just flipped around the Max app lately, right? So I'm flipping around the Max app. It's like, all the different sections. They don't just have like two, they have like 15 sections. And one of them is HGTV. And I'm like, oh, that's right. They have HGTV on Max now. I wonder what they got on there. And we just clicked it. We're sitting there. It's like 1030 at night. We're going to go to bed probably <laughs> soon. Rob, I don't know if you know about this. Not but if it's on HGTV. This show comes up that at first I look at it and I think, this is a joke, Right. Like, this looks like this person was a host on Saturday Night Live, and then they did a sketch saying, what if our host had an HGV, HGTV home renovation show? It was this. Little John. Turn down for what? It's Little John has a home renovation show called Little John Wants to Do What? And Ann and I were like, we looked at each other and like, well, we have to watch this, right? <laughs> yeah. And we play it, and you know what? It's really good. <laughs> what? It's really good. All right. Um, the, the basic premise is, I guess, four years ago, Lil John had his home renovated, and the designer that did it and him, the woman that was designing him, like, really hit it off, and they decided to go into business together. And now, like, he's the idea guy, and then she does the designing. And then they, they do this thing, right? And it's oddly entertaining to watch and they do a really good job so Ann and i so i have not gotten back on mr and mrs smith because when Ann and i are together we're either catching up with night country or we're watching little john wants to do what on hgtv nice and again it looks like it's a joke it looks like it's a, it's a sketch but it's a real show <laughs> all right anyway my throat, it kills me if I try to do a little John voice. <laughs> All right, what's next? Richard K. with a $25 super chat. Thank you, Richard K. Uh, some of the Marvel and DC characters that were never seen on screen at all, like DC Soldiers or Victory or Marvel Captain Britain, do you think characters that don't have life on the screen could have life in video games? Oh, absolutely. Of course. I don't see why not. I mean, they have to be like secondary characters at first in a video game. Like... Uh, and bring him in that way. But yeah, I don't see. By the way, I fully expect, I still do to this day, someday we're going to get Captain Britain. That's going to happen someday. I, I, I mean, it's just, it's just too interesting of a character. A lot of people thought 
once Henry Cavill was no longer going to be Superman, everybody was convinced that, that Marvel's going to hire him, make him Captain Britain. It's like, that's a little on the nose, but I, I'm convinced we will get Captain Britain someday. Do you still have a, a comic book character? Like, obviously, now that we've got Moon Knight, but do you have a comic book character that you really, like, you'd still would just love to see this character? I'd love from? to see the Jack of Hearts. Obscure character, but I'm I'd love familiar. to see Jack of Hearts in a Marvel <laughs> in a Marvel uh, movie. I don't think that's going to happen. Look, after the fact that Werewolf by Night showed up, yeah. I was like, they can go anywhere now. Anything can happen. Uh, man Thing. So I'm yeah, like, well, Werewolf by Night. There, Although yeah. Kevin Feige did produce a Man Thing movie for TV that no one remembers, but it did happen. All right, what's next? Imposter says, uh, do you think Doctor Doom will be in the Fantastic Four movie? And if so, do you think Marvel will announce the casting in a big way? I think uh, Cullion, or maybe Probably means Kill Killian. Killian. Yeah, Murphy should play him, in my opinion. Well, Again, a- it's impossible. It's, it's, it's folly to say this person should play this role because you have no idea how they're going to write the role, right? I mean, like, look at all the different Jokers we've had. They've all been completely different Jokers, and... You know, Heath would not have made a good Joker in Suicide Squad and um, so on and so forth. <clears throat> you got to it's about fitting the actor to the way the character's written in the movie. So who knows? I mean, but, you know, you start with a great actor. Killian Murphy's a great actor. So I'd be fine with that. Uh, we shouldn't talk about it, I guess. Or do you? Nah, well, we'll no. Well, no, but no, no, don't. I, I, I would say that though that I think Doctor Doom is not going to be the big bad in the Fantastic Agreed. Four movie. Yes, I think, I that's think safe the, to say. you know someone said that Annihilus and going into the negative zone. There's many other things they could do. I think they're going to have. I think Doctor Doom is going to be really important going forward. I think he's going to be introduced the same way that Thanos was introduced. Now, probably, I, I probably in heard, a tag sequence. I had heard before, and I mentioned this before. I, I had heard that Doctor Doom will be in the movie but not the big bad and not a significant part of the movie. It's going to be more setting up things for later on. Now, there's other things we've heard that... Uh, I mean, I I think it would be really interesting, and I've always said this, why why not make a movie about a villain? Why You know, they were going to make a Doctor Doom movie. I think Noah Hawley was going to make a Doctor Doom movie at Fox. Yeah, he actually, when the merger happened, first of all, Noah Hawley had already signed that. He also does... um, uh, not American Horror Story. What's the other anthology show? Um, Legion. Oh, they're doing uh, no, no. The 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 the, the one the movie. Oh, uh, tr- uh, yeah, Fargo. Fargo, right? Like, so he is also doing Fargo. He had signed the deal to do a Doctor Doom movie with Fox, and then like weeks later, Disney bought Fox, and uh, Noah Hawley tells the story. He actually told it at at Comic Con once that that like within about a month after that merger. He got a meeting with Kevin Feige. Him and Kevin Feige sat down and he explained what his Doctor Doom movie was going to be. But I, obviously, they, ne- they never went in that direction. I think that, like, <laughs> if you introduce Doctor Doom, especially if, um, uh, like, can you imagine at the end of the Fantastic Four movie, whatever happens and the the pre the post title sequence or something is Doctor Doom showing up? Yeah, I and and he doing just that. says hello, Reed. And that's the end. And then the next thing they have is an actual, their first movie about a villain. And you see what's, ha- how did Dr. Doom get here? Like what happened to Dr. Doom? How did he become Dr. Doom? Because why not? If you're going to introduce a big bad, it's time. Give us a villain film. Show us who he was, how he became to be. If, if, it, if he's at Litveria, whatever they're going to do, make a Doctor Doom film, introduce him to the post credit sequence, and bam, you're off to the races. Bam. Bam. Right. Do that, Marvel. What's next? Um, Curtis Lopez says it baffles me how people have lost their panties or have their panties in a twist seeing <laughs> Travis Kelsey yell at his coach. Have these people never watched a sports game before? Oh, yeah. Listen, athletes get like when you're in the heat of battle, athletes. Like they'll raise their voices and yell at each other and get really, but really. No passionate. one's ever seen Taylor Swift's boyfriend yell at somebody. Well, well, yes, he's mean. But they were in the Super Bowl and like it's not like oh, who was the basketball player Ray that actually choked out his coach? Uh, oh, jeez, Ron Artest. Uh, was it Artest that did or that? Was it Jermaine O'Neal? I want to. I oh, I can't. No, 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 no. Uh, Rasheed Wallace. Was it Rasheed Wallace that did it? That makes sense to me. Did you hear the coach's comments after that too? 
Andy Reid? Yeah, he, he's like, look, I mean, this he was he said it was a nothing burger. What are yeah. you saying? He, and if you look at him in that picture, he's dude, just listening. He looks yep. like he is reading a newspaper on a Sunday morning. Right. I mean, it, it's it wasn't a big, <laughs> but you have a lot of people on social media who've never watched football before. I never played in an organized sport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and 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 they all think, well, Taylor Swift's boyfriend can't be that way. No, it was it was. He's a big, a big meanie because maybe he yells at Taylor like that too. Oh no, no, she no. yells at him. <laughs> I think I think if if his big brother, if Jason Kelsey ever saw Travis yelling at a woman, he'd probably beat the shit out of him. Yeah, that you just when you watch because I'm I'm a big fan of the the Kelsey show and and yeah. like their parents. When you, you got watch me to watch it, their it's parents, great. Like those two boys were raised a certain way. Yes, you can just tell from from the stuff with their parents and their mom and the way you know Jason's wife tells a story about even how they met and stuff like that. You can just tell those two dudes were raised a certain way. Yes. And uh, and that's why, like, I, we talked about what happened at the the NFC Championship game or AFC Championship. Game. Like, Jason Kelsey is there in Buffalo with no shirt on, and right over, but sees a little girl in the stands holding up a, a, a Taylor Swift sign. Jason Kelsey climbs out of the private booth in negative forty degree weather, shirtless, goes down, takes the little girl from her mother. With the sign, he says, let's go show this to Taylor. And he carries the little girl up the steps and holds the little girl up for Taylor, for, for her to show her sign to Taylor. It's like, uh, but that's the way those boys were raised, right? So anyway, it's it's a very heartwarming stuff. Anyway, all right, what's next? Uh, Neil Dubbs says, oh, $20 super chat. Thank you. Uh, hey, John, a few days ago you said Kyle Shanahan was 0-2 in Super Bowl. As a head coach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he clarifies this. But he is 0-3, as stated by the viewer. He's 0-2 as a head coach, 0-1 as a Falcons offensive coordinator. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't count. We were, yeah. If we're talking about head coaches, like you're 0-2 as a head coach. Like, I don't care what other roles he played or whatever. He was, as a head coach, he was 0-2, not 0-3. I think he's agreeing with you. Uh, Chris Milner says, Matt, mad that F4 wasn't Jerry, George, Elaine, and Kramer. <laughs> <laughs> they are always the fantastic four. You know what? If they did do the cast announcement at an event... Right? How great would it have been if they had a curtain rise and, and they just came had out? Seinfeld st cast standing yeah, there. That would have been great. So you had Jerry and his Reed. You got Jerry and his Reed. Yeah. They got obviously Elaine and Sue. But would Kramer or George? George is the thing. Yeah. George's thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Kramer's Johnny Storm. Blame right? on. <laughs> <laughs> Is Doctor Doom just got here? Boss, <laughs> boss Logic should do this. Oh, Boss, Boss Logic, yeah, if you're should. watching, and I know that you know sometimes you are, make that. I want to see the cast of Seinfeld as the Fantastic Four. Please make that picture. All right, what's next? You know, this has a lot of gamma radiation. <laughs> uh, I was in the pool. <laughs> uh, Table Creed writes, "Hello, everyone. John, I've been watching your show for about five years now. Wow. I want to tell you how much I value what you do." Not just for me, but um, for this community, I don't really have people in my life who are as crazy about movies, movie news, TV, and streaming as I am. I didn't. We didn't get the rest. So, but oh, okay, because we had to turn the super chats yeah. off. Listen, I one of the reasons back when I did the movie blog as a blog, I started the world's first movie podcast, and was simply called very creatively the Movie Blog Audio Edition, <laughs> is what we called it, and. One of the reasons that I started a movie podcast was because I just wanted to talk to people about movies, right? And that's one of the great things about having this, this platform available to us is that it gives uh, me a place that I can just get on and talk to everybody out there about movies. And it gives everybody out there a chance to, hey, listen, I want to just immerse myself in some movie discussion. Because, you know, listen, there's stuff I love. My wife is not as into certain things uh, that I am, like when it comes to like some, some hobby stuff. So I can load up some YouTube videos on that and listen to people talk about sports card trading or, or stuff like that or, or watch people talk about hockey. Not a lot of my people I know in the States are all that into hockey. So I can there's a certain channels I can go to to get some good hockey talk or whatever. It's great that we have that, and I'm so glad that you're part of the community. So thanks for sharing that, man. I appreciate it. And sorry we didn't get to your other questions, but uh, we we ran out of time. All right, what's next? Richard K. <laughs> said, oh, $25 Super Chat. Um, Thank you, Richard. Yeah. Uh, also, do you think that uh, movies that may never get sequels 
because of box office failure, uh, cools these uh, be made in video or could these be made in video game form like make del toro hellboy 3 uh with perlman voicing as a video game or like a uh, blue beetle sequel i don't see the upside they did that with ghostbusters they made they like did a, go do a ghostbuster sequel right but but i mean they right. made a third but he's talking about specifically about movies that don't get sequels because of poor so box office make them in a video game but i mean if they if they're not getting sequels because of poor box office yeah then I, I can imagine a video game development company saying, so why should we pour $50 million into yeah. developing usually this as what, a game? Yeah, usually like, what you'll yeah. do is get, you'll get DLC. Like, oh, and you yeah. can play as, like, this Ghost Rider version or whatever, you know, but... Like, I let me look this up. Hellboy 2 box office. I, I know it wasn't a lot. Hellboy 2, it was not like... I just know it wasn't into, like, the $500 million range. Hellboy 2, the Golden Army, made a grand total... Of $168 million. $168 million. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, I can see movies getting sequels in a video game format, but not, I, I can't see a video game developer wanting to pour years of time and effort and resources into something that's already kind of failed. So I, I don't know that I could see that becoming a big thing. It's expensive too, because then you're, you're hiring known actors. On yeah, top. and you so, got you got to you voice want, over. You want to make it authentic? You want to bring Ron Perlman in? Okay. Well, he ain't coming in for lunch. He's <laughs> he's you're going to have to pay him. He's not coming in for scale. <laughs> no. And 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 then of course you're all your developers and you're going to be spending years on it on a project that didn't succeed. So I don't know. It's it, it's a it's a hard sell. I'm not going to say it's impossible. But it's a hard sell, I think. It'd be difficult to get that one by. All right, listen, uh, we're just about out of time here, but you know what? Every day we also ask our beloved YouTube channel members to fire in some topics, and uh, we got to at least take some of those. Yep. So, Jonathan, what we got up? All right, so we've got Qui-Gon Gin Tonic says, <laughs> now that we have our F4 cast, do we expect the Doom actor to be revealed in, spe in spectacular fashion? No. S say D23, or will they release it in press release? Uh, I'd love for him to be revealed similarly to how we found out about Blade with Doom Unmasked in front of 4,000 people. No, I doubt it. Um, if he's even a villain. So. Uh, because they're going to be in production by the time Comic-Con comes around. And when they've got actors on set with 500 crew members running around, they're not going to be able to keep it a secret. Uh, so I plus then you got to say, well, why did you give Doom this big pomp and circumstance and, and ceremony to announce him? But for all the other cast member, you treated them like B, B level citizens. So I I mean, I don't know. I don't know. My guess is they will reveal Doctor Doom casting the same way they reveal the Fantastic Four. Or it's his... Because again, like I said, I've heard his role is small. It's so small, they don't reveal it at all. I don't think they're gonna. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, the problem is if they introduce Doctor Doom, there's too much speculation. They should just say he's not in the movie. It's gonna. It's hard to get away with that. But well, if it's if they tell you that it's something else, yeah, you know, if it's maybe the mole man, just like in the first Fantastic <laughs> Four. Hey, all right, what's next? Uh, Gogef says odds on Deadpool and Wolverine becomes the highest grossing R-rated film ever seems likely to me. It would have to be Joker, which is uh one billion seventy nine. Yeah, so it's one point zero, right? One point zero seven seven nine. Ninety percent chance. I we were talking about this the other day on open mic and here's the thing i just don't i i haven't heard a good argument to believe that it won't hit a bill again if the movie's good if it's good if the movie's bad yeah. all bets are off but because you take this in consideration the other two deadpool movies both got close to 800 million dollars each so you're talking about to get to that billion mark you need 200 million more you need that plus 200 million more okay We've had a long wait. Deadpool is now in the MCU. So this is going to be a massive event. You're adding Hugh Jackman to it. And the Hugh Jackman, Ryan Reynolds thing has been one of the biggest things online in forever. And on top of that now, they just dropped the trailer and more people rushed to see the trailer than any other trailer in history. It just became the number one viewed trailer in its first 24 hours than any other trailer in history. And the two movies that it beat out for that top spot that were number one and number two, Spider-Man No Way Home <laughs> and Endgame, 
One of them was a $2 billion film and one of them was almost a $2 billion Mm -hmm. film. You don't think all of that added up equals to 200 million more? Really? Really? I don't see it. I I don't see how it doesn't at minimum equal another 200 million to get it over the two. Again, all bets are off if the movie's bad. If the movie's bad, that changes everything. But if it's just on par with the other Deadpool movies... Rob, I just don't see how it doesn't get to a billion dollars. I don't know. What do you think? Well, again, look, if the movie's too inside baseball, Spider-Man No Way Home really wasn't. You got the three Spider-Men together, and I, I just think that the movie, it really has to be good. If it's too meta and it goes too far into this whole wackiness, maybe the general moviegoers are going to be put off. But right now, it's it's Deadpool and Wolverine's billion to lose. I think judging by the interest in the trailer, judging by the overall interest, because it's not just Deadpool movies, you've got the X-Men franchise, and a lot of the X-Men movies that had Wolverine in them did very well. You know, X-Men 1, X2, um, Logan, even The Wolverine people thought was pretty good. So I'm, and, and Days of Future Past, so I'm hoping that I could see this being a billion dollars, and if not more, yeah. but it has I mean, to be good. I don't think it gets to 1.5. I certainly don't no. think it gets to 2. You still have the limitation of it being an R rating and all that kind of stuff. But again, take the other two Deadpools. They just about got to $800 million. Now you take all these factors, and you don't think those two, all these factors together equals $200 million more? I, You know, I, Doctor I, I Strange it. crossed $900 million. Yeah, if Doctor Strange is the multiverse, a movie that a lot of people didn't even enjoy can get to the $900 million mark. You're telling me Deadpool can't? Yeah. I, I don't see it. I don't see it. But stranger things have happened, Rob. Stranger things have happened. All right, let's and take one, one more question. Fantastic Four. Yeah, Stranger Things. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, That's true. So Facility Guy just wants to know, how will today's announcement about Fantastic Four Thunderbolts affect Marvel's panels at CinemaCon and SDCC? Well, it's SDCC. important to understand a lot of people... Uh, Confuse what CinemaCon is. There are no panels at CinemaCon. Mm. Okay, just so you know, there's no panels at CinemaCon. CinemaCon is not a fan event. It's a industry event. What happens is, is that these studios put on like two, two and a half hour, sometimes three hour presentations where like the president of the company, the CEO uh, comes out on stage and they show us like 15 minute clips, 20 minute clips. They bring out uh, like they talk about like at last CinemaCon. They came out and talked about Fall Guy. The director came out, talked about Fall Guy, and then they brought out Emily Blunt. They brought out whatever, just on stage for just like two or three minutes to say hi to everybody. And they leave. Then the president of the company comes back out. We also have coming out in March of 2024, this. And they they do a big, they show us 15 minutes of that movie, and then they bring out the director and the star. right? So they're not really any panels. They don't do announcements at CinemaCon. Because like every year CinemaCon comes up, people say, what, what big announcements do you think are coming from CinemaCon? They don't do announcements. What they do is they highlight and show off the movies they have coming up in the next 12 months. They don't announce movies that are coming in three years. They don't whatever. Like sometimes they they have dropped a casting announcement when there's a movie coming that we already know and then they want it. Because remember, the studios go to this to try to blow the socks off the movie theater owners to get the movie theater owners to give them the best deals, the most screens, the the most preferred placements, you know, all that kind of stuff. CinemaCon is about the studios trying to impress the theater owners. And uh, that's why the theater owners don't care about announcements so much. They care about the movies that are coming out in the next 12 months. San Diego (coughs) Comic-Con is, first of all, we got to get an announcement that they are going to go to Comic-Con this year because they don't go every year. I certainly hope they do. Um, but I mean, you're not going to get a fantastic four panel at Comic-Con, uh, because their cast is going to be shooting a movie. <laughs> so that, that's, there's going to be that. So I'm not sure how big, how much you, Rob, how do you see this affecting those things? Well, same thing. I mean, I, I'm with you. I, I, I don't know in terms of what they're <laughs> going to announce, but people are working. I mean, these, these, these schedules for fantastic four and Thunderbolts are pretty compressed. And they talk about how the effects industry had a real problem that, you know, Marvel was, people were working so much overtime and all this. And and I can see that isn't changing anytime soon with all the work they're going to be doing. So I don't know if they're going to have time to do any of that kind of thing. But we'll see. All right, guys. And that'll do it. 
for the today's installment of the John Campy Show podcast. Thank you so much for being here and making this show a part of your day. We certainly appreciate you being here, guys. Uh, so for everybody in the room, we got Ray Ora. Later. <laughs> we got Jonathan Voiko. Later. Writer, director, producer, Robert Meyer Burnett. Gadzuki. <laughs> my, oh, my God, if they have Godzuki in this movie. And Godzuki. Da, da, da. If they have yeah, Godzuki in this movie, oh, my God. That, my name's Sean Campy, everybody. Thanks a lot for being here. And until next time, my friends, <laughs> see you later.